It's the comeback story of the year. Tech stocks show no sign of wear as the golden earnings season continues. Also, Swiss students want it all. A new survey reveals they're looking for a work-life balance, an international work environment, as well as the chance to rise to the top. In our special big picture tonight, we bring together three of Switzerland's biggest employers to discuss the challenges of recruiting the next generation. You want to attract talent. I mean, I, I'm a chief risk officer, not a chief HR officer. And that means for me, actually, what, why am I sat here? Well, because people, we're a people business. And if we can't attract the best talent, then that, for me, is one of the biggest strategic risks we have as an organisation. And our newsmaker tonight is none other than political cartoonist Patrick Chappet, published in the NZZ, the New York Times and Le Temps. Tonight, ahead of World Press Freedom Day, he tells us what it means to work in the era of Donald Trump. We're all playing in his hand. Either we, it doesn't matter if, if you're uh, with him or against him, we're all talking about him. He's sucking up all the oxygen in the media and I'm part of the problem because I've been doing so many cartoons on him. Good evening, you're watching The Swiss Pulse. I'm Hannah Wise. Welcome to The Living Markets. Welcome to the programme. It's Wednesday, the 2nd of May. Let's start with a roundup of the main news headlines. Nestle has ended a two month price dispute with European leaders this Wednesday. The action has kept hundreds of Nestle products off the shelves. No details are available on the deal, but John Cox, an analyst at Kepler Chevreau, who we'll be speaking to live in this programme tonight, said that retailers are likely to have secured better price conditions while Nestle potentially got more shelf space or increased volumes. We'll have much more on that later in this programme. Consumer confidence weakened last month in Switzerland, according to new data from the State Secretariat for Economic Affairs. SECO said that expectations regarding future economic growth were less optimistic than in January, but the outlook for the coming months was for a positive trend. There was also some optimism regarding the labour market, with further improvements to unemployment expected this year. The latest news on Swiss retail trade turnover are not too bad either. Seasonally adjusted nominal turnover rose by 0.1% compared with the previous month. Swiss prosecutors have opened criminal proceedings into two officials at the Saudi Arabian oil producer Petro Saudi. It's all part of a much wider investigation into corruption at the Malaysian development fund 1MDB. Swiss, American and Singaporean authorities have been working for years on allegations that more than $3 billion was diverted from the fund through various government agencies and companies before appearing in the personal accounts of Malaysian Prime Minister Najib Razak. Petro Saudi denies any wrongdoing and says they're fully cooperating with the investigation. Russian billionaire Roman Abramovich has appeared at a civil court in Fribourg. His Gazprom company is accused of defrauding a publicly funded European bank out of millions of euros of taxpayers' money. The European Bank for Reconstruction and Development is suing Gazprom for payment of a long-standing multi-million loan debt. It also involves a Swiss-based company, Runicom. Now, Gazprom is arguing that Swiss courts have no jurisdiction in this complex of cases. The EU is looking to fill the monetary gap left by Britain, leaving the bloc next year with funds from plastics, CO2 and corporate tax. The new funds will amount to €22 billion Euros per year, or around 12% of the total EU budget revenue. Meanwhile, in Brexit news today, UK Prime Minister Theresa May met with her inner circle in the Brexit War Cabinet to set out the UK's course out of the EU. The most explosive topic? 
well, what to do about the Irish border and the future customs arrangements between the UK and the EU. Unless a satisfactory answer can be found soon, it could be enough to derail negotiations, leaving Britain out of the bloc with no meaningful deal at all. Now, the 48th St Gallen Symposium kicks off today. The theme, Beyond the End of Work, the symposium is organised by students at the University of St Gallen tonight. In our big picture, Anna Maria Montero is hosting a special panel discussion with Swiss students entering the job market, talking about what big companies are doing to attract the best young talent. On Thursday, we talked to three generations of leaders with special interviews from the event on Friday. Look out for our exclusive digital content as we follow the event. Now, coming up, uh, we look ahead at what's in store for the week ahead. But first, we're going to have a look at your weather forecast. Stay tuned. CNN Money Switzerland weather. We start with the webcam of the day. Here is an overview of the values recorded in the last hours. tomorrow. Here is an overview for the next days in German-speaking Switzerland. In Western Switzerland. And south of the Alps. Thanks for following us. Welcome back. You are watching the Living Markets Hour here on the Swiss Pulse. It's time now to bring you up to date with the markets news. And while it was a day of rest for much of Switzerland and Europe yesterday, Markets were still up and running in the United States. And tonight, we're going to focus on the recent slew of tech earnings. Some surprises catching us off guard. And just remember that these stocks are still trading. That's the global uh, viewpoint currently. Uh, let's get to those tech stocks. First up is Apple. Way over here. Now, the company's been battling rumours over weak iPhone X demand over the last few months. However, the company actually surprised investors when it reported solid iPhone sales. On top of that, they've promised an additional $100 billion buyback of stock. Just more proof that the smartphone isn't going anywhere just yet. Then from Apple, we move to Snap and Snapchat. If you're a longtime user of the app, you might have noticed a bit of a redesign of the messaging app back in January. You won't be alone. Fans, advertisers have noticed too, and they don't seem to be on board with the new look. Shares falling as much as 18%. Right now, Snapchat has around 191 million daily active users, but that's still short of expectation. And to finish up, uh, there's a new player on the matchmaking scene. CEO Mark Zuckerberg announced that Facebook is going to create its own dating feature. Shares in Rival, Match Group, owner of Tinder, tumbled to around 22% following the news today. Today, they have made quite the comeback. Turning our attentions to Switzerland now, this SMI finishing the day slightly up 0.1%. Despite the latest news on Nestle finishing the boycott on famous products, Nestle shares are down and they're tearing the index of blue chips along the way. More on that in just a second, but we're going to stay in Switzerland for a second longer. The shares of Swisscom are taking a dip today after the telecoms company released their first quarter results. Even though revenues were up, 
They acknowledged issues such as price pressure and increasing competition. CEO Ur Shepi said it was a solid result despite it being a, quote, persistently difficult environment. Now, as we mentioned earlier, Apple is seeing strong results and better than expected demand for its iPhone X. The knock-on effect is that iPhone supplier AMS, which is listed on the Swiss Stock Exchange, well, it also got a bit of a boost today. Shares of the Austrian-based chip maker rising by nearly 7%. Now let's turn our attention to the other Swiss company making waves today, Nestle. We mentioned it just a moment ago. It's put an end to a two-month boycott over pricing. Joining me now is John Cox, analyst from Kepler Chevro. John, we've been talking about Nestle quite a bit today. It's a, it's a major story for us. What's going on? Yeah, I think basically the food retail environment or the the uh, environment for supermarkets is incredibly difficult. And as a result, supermarkets are looking for any ways they can get maybe better purchasing terms from some of their suppliers. And a group of companies bandy together, and, and part of that group was actually Switzerland's co-op in a group called AgeCore, uh, and started negotiating centrally with Nestle uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and it's obviously been pretty tough negotiations. Uh, they, the, uh, the group of retailers actually removed some products Nestle products from their shelves, mm -hmm. just to sort of pressure um, a, uh, some sort of compromise. Uh, Mark Schneider, the new CEO of Nestle, has actually said, yes, um, there are some price differentials across national boundaries. Maybe th those price differentials were narrow, um, but we don't want to just give away pricing for the sake of it, and we want a, a sort of a, a, an agreement which is... Um, a, acceptable for I, both parties. And I yeah. guess there's a reason why they're all being pretty tight-lipped about this deal, because, you know, you've got the potential for other uh, groups to kind of jump on the bandwagon here. Yeah. No, definitely. Uh, and I think, actually, uh, Age Core was established as part of uh, another group uh, a year ago. We're doing a similar thing in the Benelux region, and we're quite successful. So I think you're going to see more of this. Uh, and obviously, what, what they want to do is get lower prices, and in the case of someone like Nestle, that means, well, obviously your, your price is going to be lower. Um, and uh, in addition, that probably puts some pressure on your margin, particularly for the commoditized type of products where the price pressure is supposed to, is likely to be the fiercest. Uh, uh, what does this tell us about the supermarket industry right now? No, it's, it's really, really difficult. I think in, in the early 2000s, you had the emergence of the, uh, the discounters coming out of Germany. I think that was the first sort of shock, uh, shock to the sector. We had rising commodity prices at the end of the 2000s. That, that had, a, had an impact when some of these supermarkets realised they could no longer pass on uh, prices. And then more recently, we have the internet uh, and the shift to grocery shopping uh, online. Uh, and obviously, people are waiting for Amazon food to come into continental Europe. So this has really uh, you know, put the cat amongst the pigeons as far as food retailers are concerned. They're all very scared about what will mm. happen. Um, these sort of tough negotiations are bound to continue uh, in Europe for the foreseeable future. Well, you, you mentioned a couple of uh, the disruptors in the industry, Amazon, mm. Aldi, Lidl, the discount stores. Mm. But what about this deal in the United Kingdom between Sainsbury's and Asda? Mm. Uh, they are buying Asda Walmart for $10 billion. I mm. mean, how... How does that change the landscape? I mean, presumably they're going to have even more buying power and even more influence when it comes to companies mm. like Nestle. Mm. No, definitely. I think, um, you know, the UK is an example where you've seen the, the sort of discounters coming in the last couple of years, uh, the normal high street guys starting to struggle, uh, and they've decided to consolidate. And the first thing they're going to do is turn around to their suppliers, the FMCGs, Nestle included, but the beverages makers, the home and personal care guys, and say, look, you know, we're bigger now, we can buy more from you. Um, you know, what can you do for us? Uh, and that will certainly put pressure on prices as well going down the road. And how much is a company like Nestle hit when something like this comes along? I mean, is this kind of thing built into their business plan? Yeah, I think, if you again, if you look in the early 2000s when the discounters first emerged, they, they were at a bit of a loss about mm. what to do. Over the coming years, then, they started to develop you know, different package sizes. So the packaging would be bigger, so they would get maybe better volumes, even though the pricing was under under pressure. So organic sales growth would still remain relatively robust and the profitability of the business would remain robust. And this is what I think will happen. 
Um, you know, if they they negotiate to lower prices, if these retailers have been successful in some some brands, remember it's not going to be the whole thing. Mm -hmm. You know, where Nestle has pricing power, uh, maybe in infant nutrition, uh, in pet care, just just as an example. You know, you wouldn't expect too much pressure on prices, but maybe things like the Maggie products, um, and we know the Tommy products mm -hmm. in mayonnaise here in uh, uh, obviously Switzerland. You know, there, there's a lot of competition in, in mayonnaise. Uh, with Maggie, you have Knorr on the other side. So, you know, these are the products that are probably going to see the price movements, not necessarily uh, the, the sort of the higher, um, the higher value add products. Uh, you mentioned some places at Nestle's uh, still making uh, growth in the pet food, the baby right. food, and Asia as well. They're still, you know, pushing the Asian market. Yeah. No, I think uh, emerging markets have actually come back pretty well for Nestle. Um, Asia and China, which is mm. the second biggest market in the world, uh, basically uh, has come back in the last couple of quarters. And actually, we've seen signs of stabilization in, in the Americas, not necessarily all of Latin America, but even in North America has been pretty decent. Where the issue has been is, is price pressure in Europe. We've already seen it. Mm -hmm. um, Western Europe is probably about 20% of group revenues. I'd imagine that pricing pressure will, will continue. Hopefully, they can offset it in emerging markets. Remember as well, they have a big cost-cutting program going on, um, a lot of it in Europe. Uh, and I think, um, you know, they should be able to offset this pressure. But it just shows that getting to that medium-term target they have uh, down the road is going to be more difficult than maybe people anticipate. And focusing in on, on Switzerland, what's price pressure like mm. here? It's, pr it's very tough. Um, obviously, what, what you saw in the last couple of years when uh, the euro fell mm -hmm. almost one-to-one -one against the Swiss franc, you've got people living on the borders. They're actually going, you know, into France, into Germany, into Italy, Austria, etc., buying the products there because the average basket size is probably 20, 30% uh, cheaper. This put a lot of pressure on the overall uh, retail space. No the strengthening franc then, sorry, the weakening franc. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is that, is that, do you think that balance will change? You'll see more shoppers staying in Switzerland? I, I think so, but there'll always be that price differential. Obviously, Switzerland is a very rich country, uh, an island in the middle of mm -hmm. Europe, uh, and prices will be more expensive here compared to what's happening uh, in neighboring countries. But certainly the weakness of the Swiss franc helps, um, will help the local retailers. People maybe think, well, why bother driving for an hour? Um, you know, I'll just go around to the co-op or, or the Migros. So that should help the local players. And just finally, how do you see the landscape of uh, the grocery industry here in Switzerland developing? You've mentioned cross-border, but what about internet shopping? Mm. I mean, you know, co-op obviously has a lot of buying, buying power with being part of age core, so. Yeah. Yeah, I think you know these these two companies are probably account for 70, 80 percent of the, the you know the Swiss mm. retail market. Um, I think it's important they stay relevant. Um, you've seen in the case of uh, Amigro Le Shop, uh, they have an internet offering, um, and as long as it's competitive, then I can't see why they will be you know left behind. Migro has its own obviously private label uh, range as well, very mm. well respected. You know, even when Amazon Food comes into Switzerland. Um, provided they, they, they're competitive, provided they have their own internet platforms, you know, they should be uh, okay. But obviously any increased competition is not necessarily a good thing for the incumbents. All right, John Cox, thank you very much indeed. Very interesting. Thank you. All right. Well, there is much more to come here on the living markets. First, though, we're going to have a look at the foreign exchange rates brought to you tonight, as always, by Swissquote.
Welcome back to Living Markets on Wednesday, the 2nd of May. Peter Rosenstrike, Head of Market Strategy at Swissquote, joins me now from our Geneva office. Uh, Peter, we've been looking at tech stock earnings today on the programme. We're going to start with Facebook. How are you feeling about this new dating feature? I'm obviously asking you in a professional capacity, of course. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't used dating services in quite a while. But, uh, <laughs> the, the, the earnings speak for themselves. You know, the the idea that this scandal had sort of rubbed off and started uh, pushing people out of the Facebook ecosystem uh, doesn't seem to be the case just yet. You know, uh, so launching something like a, a dating service seems very natural. Uh, and but you know, overall, I think the erosion of confidence, uh, the 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 worrying about privacy, will continue to. Uh, weigh on people's opinion on Facebook and, and will always haunt them. Uh, so driving this business forward, I think, might be uh, complicated. And what about the impacts on Tinder and WhatsApp? The announcement kind of really blew them out of the water that Facebook was making this expansion. Yeah, well, I mean, Facebook is a behemoth and, and it brings a, a enormous war, war chest, a huge technology capability, uh, and everything in its path uh, will probably tremble. Uh, we saw a similar reaction when Amazon uh, jumped into the fresh food space with uh, the acquisition of Whole Foods. And it's very similar uh, type of reaction when Facebook decides to move into a, uh, uh, a sector or sort of a, a business. And that's what we're seeing right now. So we suspect that as Facebook's dating app picks up um, traction, we'll continue to see things like match uh, continue to weigh. And how are we seeing investors uh, using tech stocks now? I mean, there's been a lot of volatility uh, in the first part of this year. We've been seeing tech stocks up and down a little bit, not to mention the Facebook data uh, situation. But are people still uh, rushing to tech stocks? I think there's a little bit of a sort of a calming down period. I mean, we're seeing global PMI, so global growth indicators mm. come down. We're also hearing a lot of sort of this central bank exiting strategy and the idea that the days of uh, low interest rates are basically coming to an end. And therefore, the sort of risk appetite in equity investors are going to start to come down. And that ratio between sort of a dividend yield and sort of bond yields are going to get a significantly tighter. And therefore, people aren't going to sort of jump into uh, the type of yields and expectations in uh, the tech sector the way they did once before. Uh, but it's not all golden stories that are coming out of tech. We've been talking today about Snap. They've got 191 million users. However, that's still not enough for them. They're really kind of suffering right now. Well, I mean, with extended valuations, and it'd be very difficult to for anybody to sit here and say, you know, the um, the the IT sector, the high tech sector in the U.S. is not extended. Uh, they really need to produce extreme growth stories or solid revenues, and and things like Snap. Uh, the story gets very weak in a hurry, um, and we could see how investors could uh, turn on it uh, very quickly, given the broader risk and headwinds. Let's move on to Apple because they've announced uh, a big buyback scheme uh, for investors today or recently anyway. Um, what's this telling you about where Apple is going? Well, I think, you know, it's, it's probably not as positive as uh, the market would have liked. You know, uh, the fact that Apple does not have anything innovative to do with their cash other than to buy back stocks and, and, and to keep it supported in that way, I think is a very uh, negative sign for a historically extremely innovative company. You know, the question is, what else is on the pipeline? You know, where should they be putting their cash uh, by buying back stocks or, or innovative in the next iPad iPhone, uh, so on and so forth. So the fact that they're they're using their capital uh, for this type of uh, um, uh, strategy, I think, is worrisome for their sort of development pipeline. And where do you see Apple going? I mean, is there well, concern? I mean, yeah, I think it is a concern. You know, the the innovation has been driving Apple. You know, it it, it hasn't been you know sort of stealing market share uh, through you know um, sort of uh, you know through a sort of a war of attrition. They, they've come in and created categories, and that's how it's uh, built its business. Uh, and the question is, you know, without that next 
uh, development, without that new category that's going to dominate, that's going to change the the IT environment uh, for the consumer, um, you know, stock just becomes sort of a, a, a sort of a value trade and, and one that sort of will just sit in the marketplace. OK, well, it certainly sounds tough at the top when we come to talk about tech. Uh, let's move on to global trends now. The European economy is it's, it's on the slow. So far, the central banks uh, been downplaying weaker regional uh, results. But do you think that this latest data today that the economy is slowing uh, is enough to spur the ECB into some kind of action? You know, I think the, the slowdown is not going to move them into sort of delaying um, the removal of sort of extreme monetary policy. And what I'm speaking about is the asset purchase program. Uh, we do believe that they'll continue to unwind that, whether they tighten, you know, in early, mid-2019 is probably up for more debate and, and more sort of at risk with the European slowdown. But in terms of uh, freeing themselves from the sort of monthly asset purchase burden, I think uh, there's plenty of evidence that despite the, the slowdown uh, of the European economy from a very extended level, the, the, you know, the acceleration in, in Europe has been quite strong, um, will not sort of stop the ECB's um, efforts to, to remove sort of their, their or, or to refuel their toolbox, I should say, you know, uh, uh, more than anything else. And therefore, the impact here on the Swiss uh, SNB, the Swiss National Bank? Probably not much. Um, the S and B is very happy with their their uh, um, their policy. Most likely, they're going to sit back and, and wait for um, other players to move. Uh, inflation is ticking up slightly. We are seeing a slight weakness, you know, on the growth side. I think the S and B is very happy with their strategy. Mm. It's sort of you, you continue to watch the news flow and this idea that the the Swiss franc is sort of removing itself as a safe haven trade is probably even more uh, good news to the S and B members because it means that when there is volatility, when there is risk in the marketplace, investors will not rush and start buying Swiss franc at the drop of a hat and cause sort of the the Swiss uh, inflation story and growth story to derail because of a stronger Swiss franc. All right, Peter Rosenstreich from Swissquote, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for having me. All right, it's over to Sports News now, and it's been a busy period for the National Swiss Shooting Sports Team with three major World Cups within a month. Earlier, Anna Maria Montero spoke to Matt Layton, who is uh, competing, and about who is competing, rather, and how the Swiss fare in the world of shooting. It's great to see you as always, Matt. And today you're gonna to talk to us about sports shooting, which is in the middle of a very busy period. As a matter of fact, they have what, three major World Cups just this month or within a month? Exactly. So to clarify, we're talking about sport shooting in a controlled environment. And this month on the international scene, yes, three big World Cups. We've just come off Changwon in South Korea. Why is that important? Well, the World Championships are gonna be held there later in the year. And then everyone goes across to the States this week. And Munich, which I suppose is the home of pistol rifle shooting, next weekend. So a lot going on. In Switzerland, huge sport. The Federation is one of the oldest, in fact. In fact, it was uh, set up in Aho in 1824. Around about 130,000 people regularly shoot for sport in Switzerland. 60,000 of those are members of clubs in uh, licensed shooters. Why do you have a license? Well, it means you can actually compete in international competitions. And in that, there's about 2,661 clubs. So it's a great sport. It's a very well-controlled sport. And Switzerland are rather good. They have five or six uh, international competitors that are competing around the world in top level. So, yes, everything about shooting sport is going to be happening in the next few weeks. Now, what about gender equality in this kind of sport? Are there as, much, as many women involved in sport shooting as men? No, in Switzerland, for example, I mentioned 60,000 licensed members, only 7,000 women. But in the international level, ISSF, International Shoot Sport Federation, are trying to make gender equality. So for the next games, it's going to be exactly the same men and women numbers. Also, traditionally, women have had to fire less shots, but now they're allowed to shout, fire the same amount of shots. I was speaking to one of the top Swiss athletes uh, earlier today, uh, Nina Christian, and she's saying, well, it is sort of equal, but not quite yet because the men have more practice time. 
So it's uh, a bit of an unfair thing, but they're going to be shooting the, uh, the exactly the same amount of things. They have less exposure. One thing that amuses me, though, mm. now they're shooting the same amount of shots. If you look at the Changwon competition last weekend, two out of the three major competitions where they have exactly the same, the women have better results. So I suppose you can speculate in there, speculate rather, in the next few years, will the, will the uh, categories come together? But at the moment, it's certainly, uh, I suppose, a men-dominated sport with women the better performance. Interesting. Women are turning out to be better shots, generally speaking. <laughs> all right, what are the World Cup events? And, and tell, me, tell me about this. And do all of the athletes have to go to these? Well, like I just mentioned, there are three events at the moment. The athletes don't have to go. In Switzerland, it's quite interesting because the top five or six, there's Heidi Detail Helmo in your picture. She actually won a bronze medal in the Rio Olympic Games. So she's certainly driving the sport forward. Heidi, one of the few athletes that normally goes to all the events. But the other five or six athletes, what they actually do is they are chosen by the Federation because the Federation pick up the fees to maybe go to two or three different events per season. Then they also, there's quite a big scene in Switzerland as well. There is the, uh, in a couple of weeks' time, there's the World International Military Games happening in Thun. And then there's a big event in mid-June in Switzerland. It's called the Federal Shooting Championships. It happens in villages all throughout the country. And what we have there is up to 130,000 people in Switzerland. Yes, that's 130,000 people in Switzerland shoot over one of three distances. 300 metres with a rifle, 25 metres or 50 metres with a pistol. And they each have 18 shots and we see who's the best. So yes, Switzerland at the moment is strong, going fully, and there are many top international athletes in top events. Now, as they move around the world quickly, Matt, um, how easy it is, for, is it for them to travel with guns and, and weapons? Is that a challenge at all? It's a huge logistical challenge that the Swiss are very, very good at. The Federation actually looks after the uh, administration. So often months before, especially the USA, this is a very technical challenge, they actually have to put forward exactly the serial number of the gun, they have to put forward the amount and make of the ammunition, and then they have to transport it. I suppose it's a bit like bodies and diamonds. You don't go in the normal hold of, a, of, a, of an airplane, you go in the special actual situation. So the way it works in Switzerland, yes, what you do is you turn up at the airport quite a few hours before, it goes in special, you have to go through airport clearing, you have to go through security clearing, and then you have to go through customs clearing. It's tried and tested, it works very well, but you don't want to make mistakes. And Switzerland uh, are very good at this, but you have to know exactly what you're doing. And certain authorities in certain airports around the world are known for being nightmares. Others are known for being quite simply. So, yes, it's a very controlled environment. No one's ever been shot uh, in, by accident at one of these competitions, but it's a sport that gives discipline, accuracy, good for your muscle control, and everyone seems to be happy, which I like most about the sport. Accuracy, safety, security all sound very Swiss traits. <laughs> Matt, thank you so much for being with us today. All right, summer is approaching and the Swiss outdoors is calling. But what if you're still struggling to shake off the winter blues? Well, our guest in Feeling Good Tonight has some top tips on getting energised. Stay tuned, that's after the break. Welcome back to the programme. The Swiss summer is just around the corner, as are plenty of chances to embrace the great outdoors. But if you're still flagging a little, then tonight we have some advice. The founder of BoostingNow.com says it is possible to find more energy, even without having to do a lot of fitness. Music to my ears, here's Feeling Good. Now, Barbara, just when I met you, this energy that you seem to have that's just glowing and oozing from you is rather infectious. What's your secret? Well, that's a bit of a cliche as well for me to answer, but I think my real secret is that I'm very passionate about the things that I do. So I love what I do, and I love the life that I live. And I have my bad days as well, but that's, that's I think, the it's secret. It's not always easy, though, to no. do what we love. That's probably no. one of the main problems. So how Absolutely. do we sort of get it to a point where we love every minute of our day? Yeah. Is that possible, even? No, we don't. 
You, so, so let it go, because you're not going to get to that point. You're not going to get to a point where you love every minute machine. of the day. <laughs> no. However, um, and I think that's also a bit difficult in the current days where we all say it's about finding your passion, go for your passion, and now I'm lucky uh, saying I can do what I love. But it's been, it's been hard work to get there. So it's also about making it very small, making it very practical, and saying, hey, maybe just start by bringing some focus in your day and finding out what are actually the things that give a smile on your face. And generally speaking, it's logic that we need energy to be able to yeah. fuel our bodies to do things, to yeah. do the things we do. Uh, can you calculate energy levels? How does that work? How do you assess? Yeah, well, you can definitely. There are so many things, so many ways and trackers that you can use to, to measure energy. Uh, and there's also, I mean, energy is about ATP, which is a little powerhouse in your body and your mind. It's in your brain cells as well. ATP. And, ATP. It, what does yeah. that stand for? Yeah, so that really is your the molecules that are in your body um, and that generate energy. So it's a little power. It's a very, uh, I won't go into all the technical details, but it's a little powerhouse in your body that makes sure that your muscles can function, that your, uh, your body is actually functioning. Um, so you can measure that. However, that's very technical and you really need the experts for that. So what we really believe in is asking people, how energetic do you feel? Uh, what did you do the past month, the past weeks? Uh, how much sleep did you get? How much water did you drink? All those elements that really uh, generate energy, you can ask people for that and then you get a, a rather... A sensible idea about how the energy level is. And what are the patterns in terms of age groups and sexes and races? Does it really vary? Because we often say something like, oh, I wouldn't have the energy for yeah. that in my 40s or my 50s or my yes. 60s. Is that true? Yeah. Well, there are absolutely, there are lifestyle factors and there are biological factors. So the lifestyle factors is what you can change yourself, right? It's not easy, but there, those are things that you can change. The biological factors are things like age, genetics, hormones, circadian rhythms, and those are the things that you can still also affect with lifestyle. However, these are also things just the way they are. Uh, so over age, with hormones, with differences in your uh, circadian rhythms, your sleep and wake cycle, there are definitely things that uh, change over the years. And your, in your experience, what really sucks energy, sucks the life out of us, that we feel like, yeah. oh. Yeah. You can't be bothered. Yes. Uh, negativity. Uh, so being around uh, people that ask negative energy from you, hearing negative things. So that's one. But maybe even more important is not being in control or having the feeling of not being in control. And then, then I don't mean being in control that you have your Excel sheets and you make your project plannings, though not that kind of control, but control over your life, that you actually have the feeling that you can choose what you're doing and that you actually make the right choices there. So then we talk about fitness and energy becoming like an anchor yeah. to, to go about our daily life. Absolutely. I think once you have set your routines and made it a, a habit and really made it part of your daily life, then they become their anchors. And I think people who are far away from that, they would never see that as their anchors. I had an interesting conversation today about emails and how draining yes. emails are, how yeah. long they take to write, you disturb your colleagues, you get forward emails forwarded and ping pong Absolutely. back and forth and then you've got like 500 in your inbox unanswered. <laughs> yeah. How do you get rid of emails and negative people? Ooh. <laughs> well, the thing with emails, I think that's a very good example because it's actually what I just said about being in control. Emails is exactly the same as, let's say, 20 years ago, you would be working, you'd be in your office, and non-stop somebody would run in and ask, may I ask you this? May I ask you this? You would go absolutely crazy. And that's the same what we do with our emails. We think that we have to respond right away. So actually, you're never doing what you're actually want to do or what you plan to do. So emails is very much about discipline, making your discipline that way that you only answer them in between certain brackets or in between uh, those times that you have planned for emails. And do you find a pattern in uh, the friendships you keep, the relationships you have? Do you have similar energy levels with those people? No, very different. Very different because energy is also something that you take from the other person, right? You have you have, well, what they say, there's a lot of literature about this, but you have the so-called pluggers, people that come to you, just plug in <laughs> there, you see it, you see it, right? And then after an evening, you feel like, oh, God, everything, the energy is just out because um, there's just a very different energy level from yours. And you have givers, the people who, who actually give you a lot of 
uh, of energy. So there's very different energy levels at different people. And in terms of looking at uh, lifestyle and a recipe to fill that good energy, that changes too, right? I mean, what was fitting for one season two years ago might not fit to you two years later. I hope so. I hope so because it means that we're developing, right? And that we're growing and that we're learning. So definitely it is something to... So that's why we always say, and also when we go to to companies where we do the, the programs, we always say it is about knowing your own body uh, and also knowing how you respond to things. If you're just on the go, non-stop, and you cannot actually listen to what your body or your mind is telling you, then you also don't know what is giving you energy. So it's very much something about being in touch and being connected with your In own Switzerland, body. are we good at connecting with our bodies, do you think? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> if not you're employed, sure. probably no, not. <laughs> no, I'm not sure. Well, I think in, in any, uh, any corporate environment, it's, it's rather difficult because there's a high pressure, high performance. So, so I think it's right. I, I myself come from consultancy and it's not necessarily what people are doing all day. Um, however, I do think that it's getting more and more important. If you look at, the, at just the numbers here in Switzerland, there's a 40% of the employees, they feel long-term burnout or, or weakness uh, um, that is there. I mean, that costs so much. It costs, I think they calculated it, it costs the economy every year almost 7 billion Swiss francs. How do we prevent burnout then? Yeah. Can it be prevented? Well, I think the most important thing is that we acknowledge it. So it starts with awareness. Is there, burnout is not about weak people. Burnout is it's about not having the right match of what you're doing and what you want to do. Uh, very simply said. I mean, uh, uh, there's a lot to say, more to say about that. But it's, yeah, talking about being prevented, I think step one is being aware about uh, of it and then getting your people engaged. I think if you have highly engaged people, and again, 75% of the Swiss employees are not engaged in their company and what they're doing, 70%, 75%. So having highly engaged people, that is a big, big risk or, or at least a big uh, predictor that the burnout numbers will go down. So surely, I mean, looking after energy levels of employees is good for the company and good for the individual. Absolutely. Are companies enough, are doing enough to ensure that well-being and energy levels are as they should be? No. No. I mean, you see the token bowl of fruit now and then, a Absolutely. meditation course. Exactly. But... but it's all a bit pieces there, pieces there, and, and really offering a holistic program where you say, hey, you know what, it's in our own interest as a company to put the employees, to take care of our employees. And it's actually, I mean, there's been, by now there's been so many business cases and, and it's, it's hard numbers, it's 21% profitability what goes up if you have highly engaged people, if you have an environment where people really are being taken care of. And of course, it is about finding the balance between it's the own responsibility of employees and it's the responsibility of companies. However, you can really well um, uh, stimulate this culture where you think, hey, it's, it's totally normal. It's okay to take care of yourself. It's okay to turn off your phone after 11 uh, and, and more of those kind of things. And your belief is that many of us are underperforming. We're actually shortchanging ourselves in terms of our Absolutely. potential and how yes. great we can be. Um, but we're all unique. So would you, is it fair to say that everyone has a different energy level, a maximum? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We're all unique in that. Everybody has it. Uh, uh, one flourishes in the morning, the other in the in the evening. I mean, there there's a lot of differences there. So it's very much not. I have a lot of energy, and it's not about everybody getting to the same energy level as I have. It is very much. But again, you have to know yourself in order to even know where your em, em, energy limitations are. And it's also about finding out about you as an individual and what relaxes you, what helps Absolutely. to restore the energy. Uh, how do you work with people to find out their thing? What re yeah. really makes them yeah, work at their best? Yeah, what makes them work at their best? Well, I think there are two important things. Being able to relax and unwind and, and even allowing that uh, uh, to, to relax after a day full of stress, for example. A lot of times when there is a day full of stress, afterwards you go looking for more adrenaline, right? Or more stimulants. So you either go online shopping or you go for alcohol or you go out <laughs> for all kind of other things. But that doesn't lower your adrenaline. Um, so you, you will never give you... And that's actually dangerous for your health uh, if you're not able to, to lower those stress levels. So that's one... And, and, and finding the right way that works for you personally... 
However, there is, of course, a lot of research already that going on your mobile phone is not the way that relaxes in the long run. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so th so that's an important one. Is there a nation out there that you believe have got it right? Not a whole nation, I think. Well, they always say that Bhutan is this, they have their <laughs> index of happiness, right? So there are some examples there. Uh, and there are some islands in, in the, uh, the Pacific where they also do really well on, on those kind of things. But no, I, I, I wouldn't say. But we are super busy. Super. How yeah. do we just take the time to take care of ourselves to pamper ourselves, indulge ourselves? Yeah, it starts by, um, I think, really big mind shift that sleeping or taking care of yourself is not about laziness or about weakness. Actually, you're a very strong person if you take care of yourself and if you prioritize that, because you can outperform the next time again. So I think it's really, it's what, um, uh, what also in the book, the sleep Rev uh, revolution have been mentioned, saying, okay, we had the industrial revolution and we said, and there we worked so hard in being available available non-stop and now we have to learn that we're burning out ourselves uh, and on a meta level also the whole, the whole society if we do not learn how to rest and to stop and unplug. The best thing for me about going on a vacation on a holiday is just switching off a phone, yes, really. not having email contact and that for me relieves so much stress and tension. I think I'm already feeling better. Yeah. Is that a general thing that you come across? Absolutely. It's a very general thing. There's a lot of uh, companies by now also have, maybe for other reasons, but they also have their um, uh, the, the regulations that you need to be offline for one or two weeks. Um, and people find it so freeing that they're like, oh, that, that is amazing. And I think if you already have that sensation, then it's definitely something that you, that to work on, to think about, because then maybe, hey, why only do it twice a year? Uh, or maybe you're going on holiday three times a year, but maybe why, why not incorporate it in your own life on a daily basis and get that feeling during the normal week as well? How do you convince some of these corporate people yeah. to get on board with you know, finding their energy, finding their... <laughs> Depends a bit where they at at their moments. You always have to meet the company where they're at, right? I, I ver I'm very passionate about what I do, but I try also not to preach and start to say, like, this is what you're supposed to do. So I believe by making it fun, that's one thing, by really being inspiring and motivating instead of you have to do this or you have to do that. And convincing companies is, is easy when you show them the numbers. If you show them like, hey, this is, this is what's in there for you, the, 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 your profit, your performance, they will go up. And, and what we also see with our, our programs, we see like even if in three months of a program, you see that people about 80% changes habits. So they already start changing routines uh, by showing companies that, then um, uh, uh, that should be enough. And any future trends that you're seeing, the direction that we're moving in for the good or for the bad? Yeah, well, I hope, but I'm a positive person, but I very much hope you see and read and, and, and hear a lot about the, that people start acknowledging what the effect of sleep is and the lack of sleep and sleep de being sleep deprived, um, what the effect also is on organizational performance. So I, I really hope with those numbers and with that research, I really hope that, um, uh, that companies will put their well-being program and their engagement program really top priority. And not only because they think that they will keep their people for a longer time, but because they really see that there is no other option, actually. Because they care. And any of these gadgets and that, I mean, are they are they effective? Like you track your sleep, for yeah. example. But... Well, they are. They they are effective, uh, and they're a nice gimmick, and they're nice to do. And that is, if that inspires you, and if you're, for example, performance driven, then a lot of time you're like, oh, I want to do better. I want to do better. But it's not building a long lasting routine. The long lasting routine, I believe, only comes when you connect your health goals, your fitness goals, when you connect them to more life goals. So if you say, I want to sleep better or I want to lose weight or these kind of, just because, you won't build, you won't, when it gets, when the going gets tough, you stop, right? But when you really have a clear picture why you want to do it and where it's going to bring your life, then you will be motivated and you won't need me anymore for that. So integrate it into your life, don't just have it as a quick fix or Absolutely, quick no quick window. fixes. Yes. Barbara, thank you so much. Well, welcome, mm -hmm. thank you.
All right, stay with us here on the Swiss Pulse. Coming up next, we've got the big picture hour. It's a special one tonight. The 48th St. Gallen Symposium is underway today. Anna Maria Montero has all the details next. CNN Money Switzerland Business Weather, starting with Europe. Next step, Africa and the Middle East. Southeast Asia. And now Australia and Oceania. Let's go to North America. We end our trip with North America. CNN Money Switzerland accompanies you all over the world. Swiss students want it all. A new survey reveals they are looking for a work-life balance, an international work environment, as well as a chance to rise to the top. In our special big picture tonight, we bring together three of Switzerland's biggest employers to discuss the challenges of recruiting the next generation. You want to attract talent. I mean, I, I'm a chief risk officer, not a chief HR officer. And that means for me, actually, what, why am I set here? Well, because people, we're a people business. And if we can't attract the best talent, then that, for me, is one of the biggest strategic risks we have as an organization. And our newsmaker tonight is none other than political cartoonist Patrick Chapet. Published in the NZZ, the New York Times, and Le Temps, tonight ahead of World Press Freedom Day, he tells us what it means to work in the era of Donald Trump. We're all playing in his hand. Either we, it doesn't matter if, if you're uh, with him or against him, we're all talking about him. He's sucking up all the oxygen in the media and I'm part of the problem because I've been doing so many cartoons on him. A very warm welcome. You're watching The Big Picture. I am Ana Maria Montero and let's get it started. As always, it is time now to check out those news-making headlines here in Switzerland and around the world. Consumer confidence weakened last month in Switzerland, according to new data from the State Secretariat for Economic Affairs. SECO said that expectations regarding future economic growth were less optimistic than in January, but the outlook for the coming months was for a positive trend. There was also some optimism regarding the labor market, with further improvements to unemployment expected this year. Russian billionaire Roman Abramovich has appeared at a civil court in Fribourg. His Gazprom company is accused of defrauding a publicly funded European bank out of millions of euros or taxpayers' money. The European Bank for Reconstruction and Development is suing Gazprom for payment of a long-standing multi-million loan debt. It also involves a Swiss-based company, Runicom, now, Gazprom is arguing that Swiss courts have no jurisdiction in the complex case. The EU is looking to fill the monetary gap left by Britain leaving the bloc next year with funds from plastics, CO2, and corporate tax. 
The new funds will amount to 22 billion euros per year, or around 12% of the total EU budget revenue. Now, in Brexit news today, UK Prime Minister Theresa May met with her inner circle in the Brexit War Cabinet to set out the UK's course out of the EU. The most explosive topic? what to do about the Irish border and the future customs arrangements between the UK and the EU. Unless a satisfactory answer can be found, soon it could be enough to derail the negotiations, leaving Britain out of the block with no meaningful deal at all. And tonight in our big picture, a special panel discussion on Swiss students entering the job market and what PwC, V4 Pharma and Zurich Insurance are doing to attract the best young talent. Part one of that program is coming up right after the break. Don't go away. CNN Money Switzerland weather. We start with the webcam of the day. Here is an overview of the values recorded in the last hours. speaking Switzerland. In Western Switzerland. And south of the Alps. Thanks for following us. Welcome, everyone, to this special edition of The Big Picture. And tonight, we're doing it in partnership with Universum and their survey on Swiss students and how they rank their potential employers. Now, we've got a great panel discussion coming up for you in just a moment. But first, we're going to have a look at those findings. Now, first up, who is the ideal employer for over the 10,000 students surveyed for this? Google, number one for Swiss business students, almost a quarter of them prefer this over all other companies. In engineering as well, uh, ABB was number one for Google, but in engineering also, Google ranked number two. So by far, ideal employer in Switzerland is going to be the tech giant. Now we've also got what students want to do the most after graduation. And as we can see in three sectors, business engineering and IT, they all want to work at a company or organization that has an international profile. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that they want to go abroad, but they do want to have that in the mix in terms of their employers. However, interesting, they do not want to work at companies that have more than 1,000 employees. So they want to go international, but less than 1,000 employees. Top three career goals for our Swiss students of today. Number one, a work-life balance. Above everything else, they're looking for flexible working hours, positive work environments, places where they feel like they want to show up and go to work and spend their time. Number two, they want to be a leader and they want to manage people. And of course, number three, they want to be entrepreneurial or creative and innovative. However, they do not show an interest in necessarily being part of a startup culture. And then just to finish up, the gender gap. Business students' salary expectations. Now, this is something that surprised me. Males still have a higher expectation for salaries than females by a difference of almost 4,000 francs, three to, to 4,000 francs. So this means that out of the gate, females are already expecting to be paid less than males. So a lot of interesting things to look at tonight 
um, in these findings by Universum and their Swiss students survey. And now it is time to meet the panel that has joined us for this evening's discussion. Thank you all for being here. It's really great to have you. Thank you. Um, all right, we'll get started with meeting the panel then. Michaela Christian Gartman, you are head of HR Switzerland for PwC, PricewaterhouseCooper. Next to you, our only gentleman on the panel this evening, Michael Bury, he's Chief HR Global of Vifar Pharma. And Alison Martin, Chief Risk Officer for Zurich Insurance. All right, guys, thank you so much for being with us again. It's good to be here. Okay, let's get this started. I mean, I don't know about you, but my expectations when I finished school were not necessarily balance, work-life balance was not the first thing that came to mind when I thought, where do I want to work? What about you? What were your expectations? Well, in fact, when I finished my education, I was really hungry to start my professional career. And for me, it was also a lot about hard work. And I remember that there were three things that were very important to me. One, the possibility to learn. Two, the possibility to bring in my ideas, to shape. And three, to work in an environment with great people. And even today, these factors are very important to me. So work-life balance was not on your list. No. <laughs> necessarily. <laughs> and you, Michael? Um, it doesn't seem like that long ago, so. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't. But a, um, uh, what was interesting is that, well, I have a very international background. So for, for me, the, 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 the sector, the industry I was looking for had to be have an international background. So that kind of like, um, you know, follows wh okay. what the students have been saying. Did you want to work abroad? Or um, just... Not necessarily. It was more a company that accepted someone who came from uh, an international background, multicultural. It was more looking for that type of environment. Okay. But I was more interested in getting a foot in the door and getting that, that first experience because I knew that would value my CV in the future. And I still remember it was the day where you'd go every Saturday or Wednesday and buy the newspaper, get those clippings out, get Absolutely. in the mail and wait two weeks before you got an answer. Right. And that was, it was those days of hard work. So the lesson is, you know, never give up and keep trying. And I think uh, these days, technology has made things a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. And maybe even too easy, but we'll get to that. <laughs> what about you, Alison? So I'm very impressed by the uh, forethought that my, my fellow panelists had on what they wanted to do. I must admit, I think when I was a student, I had very little idea as to what I was actually looking for in a future employer. Mm -hmm. I just wanted a job. And I was yeah. really more focused on looking for a company where I thought there was opportunity to do something, but I wasn't really sure what that was. So optionality, I think, would have mm -hmm. been my, honestly, if I look back as to my younger self, I didn't really know. So were you guys surprised to see that our, um, our millennials, because they are our generation, mm. we're talking about generations mm -hmm. Y and Z, who have filled out these surveys, had work-life balance as a, now we, are, we will talk more about the millennials mm -hmm. later, but initially, were you surprised that they had this at the top of their list? I have not been surprised because this has been a topic now that we have seen over the past years. Mm -hmm. And I find that um, the time and to have the balance is like the new currency. So this is something that, that we see very much in our day-to-day -day realities. You? So I, I'm not surprised, but the reason I'm not surprised is more because I think it's important for everyone now rather than I think it's particularly mm -hmm. important for graduates. And if I look at the things which our employees are looking for from an employer, it's flexible working. Mm -hmm. so, so from that perspective, I can understand that graduates would see the environments in which this is operating already and they would be more attractive. Right. So this leads me to what are your companies in particular doing? What are you proposing as solutions to address this, this growing need, Michael, for example, at Vifor? Mm -hmm. I think one of the <clears throat> one of sorry one of the things that's really important for us is to when we talk to candidates is to understand why they're particularly interested in the job and what we have to offer. So we don't jump into work life balance but we really talk about their their main their main need and what comes back systematically when I talk to all our recruiters are two things. One is tell me about the job and what what it has to offer me and why is it interesting and the second one will you if I come in your company will you develop me? Mm. And because okay. most of our recruiters are from a young generation, uh, they are able to talk about the work-life balance stories they've been through. So is this a fun place to work? Do you have time off? Do you have flexible hours? So that's how we try and engage with our candidates is by having our young generation talk to them as well. That's, that really works very well. And what about you guys at uh, PwC, Michaela? How are you addressing this? So for us, flexibility is very important being um, at the professional services firm. 
So we live by the credo, we expect flexibility, but we also give flexibility. Okay. And we do this with our flexible annual, um, annual working time model, which is very attractive. And it also leaves a lot of opportunities so that individual needs can be flexed. Okay. And we also have a lot of flexible work arrangements. So this is something that people like. And we also talk about this, of course, because it's very much part of the deal when you join PwC. Right. It's the nature of the job is yes. such that flexibility has an innate part of that. Is, exactly. Is, is it the same for you? Very similar, I think. Mm. Flexible working, it, to me now, I think it's a hygiene factor yeah. that you offer it. I think the critical thing is that people see that leadership role models it. Mm. Because it's one thing to offer flexible working, but if people actually come and join an mm. organisation and don't find that anyone actually does it, then and if they see that the leaders expect people essentially to be at work, then it, it doesn't work. So for us, it's more about role modelling. I think what, what, what we notice is that, you know, life happens at work mm. and work takes uh, comes with you back home so how do you how do you work with those boundaries which are not yeah. there anymore and i think it's by giving people the time at work to have some life moments yeah. mm -hmm. value those life moments like yeah. you know being a young mother having to go back and someone mm -hmm. uh, is not well at home and take care of the child but also understanding that sometimes if i leave early can i finish what i'm doing back at home and i think having understanding for that mm -hmm. and being yeah. able to allow that to happen yeah. without controlling it in a very strict way is what yeah. this generation likes mm. Yes, it's definitely, I, I'm just, I'm listening to you all talk and I can't help but think of my own situation where I, I never would have had these conversations with my employees. You know, when, when I started work, I was, you know, similar to you. It was just, you were there, you were happy to do your job and this discussion about flexibility. So it's so interesting that now it really dominates our conversations yes. when we talk about young people and, and work and young talents. Now, another finding, of course, with it was that most of them want to work at companies with international profiles, mm -hmm. which all of you fit with. Less, but less than a thousand employees, <laughs> yes. <laughs> which isn't for me a contradiction. Yeah. Is it just me? Yeah, I, I, I read the same and thought it's an interesting. And whether you want to have access to the a global environment and brands and values, which actually take the benefit of having an international presence, but actually that's quite challenging with less than a thousand employees. Yeah. So I wasn't quite sure how to square that circle. Yeah, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. you're, 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 mm -hmm. I felt exactly yeah. the same. Yes, when I when I read this, and I also thought, well. You know, we are definitely more than a thousand employees in Switzerland and across the globe. Mm -hmm. Yet, uh, the, our experience is very international. But I qu couldn't quite understand where where this limit of a thousand uh, comes from. Maybe, maybe I can help. Mm -hmm. because, yes, I, uh, I was going to say, so buy for. <laughs> we, we're really lucky because of um, our size and being international. So we are two and a half thousand worldwide. But if you look at how we've uh, got our offices set up, not, uh, most of our offices are never more than three to 400 people. And what we really are able to mm. offer is an environment where family and global come together. Mm, okay. And I think what it allows people is to stay connected, know people and know the human mm. being beyond <clears throat> just knowing the processes and the rules. And I think that, that's an advantage of our size. And we try and use that advantage so that when people join with us, they get very quickly into the organization. Mm -hmm. So this notion of global family means... So you found the solution. You've got the... You worked well, our it size out. helps it's... us. And if you use that, I yeah. think that's, that's a way of doing it. And maybe, you know, as you become big, is how do you, how do you keep size and the connectivity mm -hmm. alive? You know, that's, that's what you have to constantly think about. I think that's connection mm -hmm. to purpose, isn't it? And I think you can make it on a on a very large scale, or you can do it on a. Yeah. It's arguably easier on a smaller, smaller scale, scale. Yeah. but if you can manage to do it on a larger scale, then you can galvanise tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, in your case, right, in case of yeah. workers to actually achieve the goals. Mm. Did you want to add anything? Yeah, I was just going to say that you also touch on a very important point: connectivity. I think. People really want to have like friends at work and irrespective of the size, it's very important to feel these connections, to feel that you are part mm -hmm. of a family like you said. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think this is going to be, or this is the art, how can you, how can you bring this into your culture so that this is the feeling uh, mm -hmm. that transports um, as you go to work. Uh, I think mm -hmm. the... You know, every company should have their secret sauce in doing this, but um, you cannot fake it. So if you yes. if you yes. try and force yeah. it, people mm -hmm. will see that. You know, mm -hmm. you can say it, you can put policies in place, but if you yeah. you walk in a place and you immediately feel there's a family feel here, there's a culture mm -hmm. feel, there's mm -hmm. a connectivity yeah. feel, and that's the hard work. Day in day out, you have to keep that culture alive. Mm -hmm. So, I yeah. think the, the there's no there's no there's no 
you know, silver bullet here. It's just yeah. really making sure if that's the company you want, well, live it. And I think you were right about saying yeah. leaders have to do that, managers yes. have to do that, and employees, um, you know, on a daily basis have to feel that this is the work environment they live in. Right. All right, and the last one, the last findings we uh, looked at was, of course, this situation of the gender gap. Now, I know, right? Every, I think we all, I cringe a little bit as a woman, you know, as a female, and I think out of the gate, young women are expecting to be paid less. What, what is this about? Is the glass ceiling already in place in universities, or? Whoop, no answer, wow, okay. <laughs> no, 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 I didn't know if somebody was gonna jump in with something, so I'll start with you. What do you think? Um, well, first of all, I think we know from our uh, socialization that this has also a lot to do with how women um, were brought up and the developments that we now see. Mm -hmm. PwC has also done some reports on this, which I find really interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, to your point, is there, you know, does it start with a gender pay gap? I think this is something that we have that we all have to address to really close this and prevent this. Mm -hmm. Now, what we are doing at PwC is um, we don't have you this. You don't have this. No, because we also, um, I mean, when, we, when you start working at PwC, um, we have our salary system that looks into the different factors and it doesn't matter whether you are a woman or a man. Mm -hmm. Plus, also to make this now more transparent, we are striving to get a certificate for equal pay. Um, Which is the edge. Yes. Certification, yeah. Uh, sorry, with the um, salary equals... Equals, uh, yes. Yes. Okay, all so right. This so this is something are, that we are now doing. You're taking concrete yes. steps in yes. this direction. What about, what about Vifor? Um, I think that the gender pay gap is, um, is something that, you know, a lot of people will be talking about now because it's really out mm -hmm. there. What is mm -hmm. important to, to understand that every company has had, has policies and for V4, it's very important that you know, the two things we can really control as an organization is what is your compensation policy and are you yeah. sure you've got, uh, are you making sure you've got equal pay and, and equal pay for equal work in there? Yeah. And the second thing is, are you benchmarking you know, in, the, in a fair way what, what the job is worth on the market? And you can control that because you can then make sure you're offering people the right value for the right job. The thing you can't control is what the individual brings to the table. And individualization is a, is a wonderful thing because it allows potential to express mm -hmm. itself, um, you know, value, uh, bringing other skills, and that is where the whole bargaining power starts. So there's a notion of you, you want to offer things and keep things, um, you know, fair, but then there's an individual part which makes the difference. And do you find that, that but do females go in already undercutting themselves? Has that been your mm -hmm. experience? I honestly don't know. And I was going to approach it from a slightly different angle. So okay. I wonder to what extent their expectations are set by the role models that they see. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I'm particularly pleased that Zurich has is a 45-55 board mix of women to, to men. Mm -hmm. And we have 25% on our executive committee of women and will improve. And we are the best in the SMI top 30 by a long shot. And I think actually that can help set expectations for people at whatever levels that actually they should be able to demand equality because they see that actually there is an equal representation at the top. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to approach it from all of the yes, different lenses yes. that we've talked about. And something that I noticed also in interviews was mm -hmm. that when, when it comes to negotiating the, the salary, mm -hmm. that for men, uh, typically a straight figure comes, whereas for women, they, they uh, talk about first um, the importance of their job, um, what, what matters to them, and yeah. when you then talk about um, the salary, it's like, well, you know, they are, they are not really um, bringing forward the uh, figure. It's a clear more, number. Yes, okay. so it's more like a hesitation. And so I think this is also something to, that, mm -hmm. we, that we can help, to also help women mm -hmm. to, to be more confident when it comes to negotiating mm -hmm. their packages. Welcome back to The Big Picture. Google is the one to watch when it comes to attracting young talent in Switzerland. The tech giant is considered the ideal employer by business students, and according to a new survey by Universum. Now, in the second part of our special panel discussion, our guests talk about the challenges of recruiting new employees. 
But before that, I asked if attitudes in the workplace do vary greatly between generations. Now we're gonna switch gears to talk about more about this generation shift. So as we mentioned earlier, our students surveyed are mostly um, so-called millennials mm -hmm. and the generations Y and Z, and the employers are mostly generation Xers or baby boomers. So there's already like a gap. We're gonna look, if you guys wanna turn around really quick, we've got this um, pulled up here. So we have, as you can see, the interest, you know, where the things, cro where the, the interests cross, you have career path, they want to climb the ladder. The millennials want to create their own ladder. You know, in the work environment, we use more nine to five. Millennials want to work from any place, anytime. So, I mean, it's a big difference in little time, as we <laughs> also discovered earlier. It hasn't been that long since we finished school. And, um, and interestingly, the top uh, employer who seems to fulfill these, all of these uh, requirements is Google. Mm. I'm not surprised, I take it. You guys surprised? No. No. No, no, no surprise. All right, the ideal employee, they want, they have that feel at home experience. Mm -hmm. um, do you, as, at your companies, have you felt like a pressure to Googleize in a sense and attract these generation Y and Zs? Of course. On this level. I, I mean, I, I think you, you, you want to attract talent. I mean, I. I'm a chief risk officer, not a chief HR officer. And that means for me, actually, what, why am I set here? Well, because people, we're a people business. And if we can't attract the best talent, then that, for me, is one of the biggest strategic risks we have as an organization. Mm -hmm. So it's critical that we can attract talent. I, I think the, the career paths is a really interesting example of, OK, how can you help all of the workforce, whether that's the Gen X and Y, Z, whether it's the baby boomers, understand career paths, actually, they can't be vertical anymore. If you look at changing demographics, we actually, we, we cannot, as a society, we need to be able to accommodate a broader range of different type of works, whether that's part-time working, much more flexible working. Mm -hmm. And that means the ladder is not the same today as it was. And that means it's, it's a path. It's a journey. It's a horizontal. It may sometimes go down. Maybe it's snakes and ladders now would be snakes. a better analogy. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's about... It, helping people understand what does that dynamic mean and then giving them real pathways and opportunities where they can continue to grow. So for us, it's really important. It's about a growth mindset. It's about how do you encourage people that that's what matters in the future to be successful. Critical to, a, to, to attract this young yes. talent. Michael, do you I, agree? I, th I think from a, you know, when you're already a family and you're a global company, you're not looking for the, um, a large number of of, of people, you're more looking for the, the right type of person. Mm. And when we come to the, this type of generation, for us what's really important is that they really understand the culture of the organization that, and whether it fits their needs. We are lucky enough that every ad we put out there, we get an, a, quite a good number of responses. And with, for example, the student of the year that we're participating in, what, what's interesting about that is that that young generation, when they get the chance to become a student of the year in our company, they meet the vice president of the function that is going to give them the sponsorship. They spend an hour with them. They walk, walk them through the program. And they, at the end, they're there when they, when they graduate. Mm -hmm. So they're really immersed immediately in the family. They're not like put on some kind of parallel route of internship. They really get into the organization. So I think as, if you can show them, you can bring them in very quickly and you can g g allow them to contribute. And one of our values is entrepreneurship, so they like that. I want to be an entrepreneur, but pharma, right, so you've got a, but pharma <laughs> is serious, so you have to make them understand, well, it's right. a serious business, it's, it's pharma. But at the same time, entrepreneurship can express itself, you know, and this is what, what they like. And when they go out, they talk about this, you know, and I think that's what's important. I, I think we might come to branding at some point, but they are our best ambassadors. If you really live this and they yeah. can experience it, they'll, they'll, they'll say the best things about your own, you know, your own culture. Well, now that you've, you've opened that door, we were going to get to branding, okay. especially now you have particular experience. You've had to rename your company in the last year. Five, four, so you have, have you had branding challenges in this respect? So just to correct, so the Galenica Group became V4 Pharma Group, so V4 Pharma as a name was all the out there. But the, we used that moment to talk about V4 Pharma Group as a standalone pharma company and becoming number three Swiss pharma company in, you know, in Switzerland, mm -hmm. joining the SMI. I think that's a great moment to use those, those events in your life to talk about what you are and who you are. But mm -hmm. inside, the company is, is, has remained uh, you know, very close to its heritage and its roots. And what they like is this mm. global Swissness, doing good for patients. And that's a great story mm. to talk about and build mm. your brand around. Mm. Do you have any thoughts on the, on the brand value? 
Or I'm just gonna go for with a new question for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna go with a new because you know my I'm thinking you know you see Google it's it's ranked as a top place to work. That's where everybody wants to be. Price Waterhouse Cooper is also a company with a very strong brand, yes. very strong brand identity. Yes. Um, do you feel how important is it to see PwC on the same level as Google? Well, in general, it is very important to us because we want to be very attractive. We have to find the, the best talents that are excited to work for us. So this is something that is very important Crucial. to us. Yeah, yes. So, yeah. And uh, so we also invest a lot in being attractive to uh, millennials, but of course also to uh, talents of other generations. Mm -hmm. And what we have now done, when, we, when I now look back, um, we started to dig into what are the special needs um, of millennials uh, 10 years ago, and we studied that. Mm -hmm. And there are certain things that we see that today is a must, like, for example, the whole, um, uh, the whole giving feedback, instant mm -hmm. feedback, to mm -hmm. really inspire um, our people through um, by their leaders, things like that. In the past, um, it was enough to have annual discussions, but this is no longer true. So we have adapted our approach to this in order to also be more attractive to these talents. All right, and last question, because we're running out of time. In terms of attracting and, and, and um, how, do you, how do you offer a creative, how do you make these environments more creative for, for our young talents? How do you There's appeal lots of things to you do. I mean, I, 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 a simple example of something that we've very recently been doing is um, something called Make the Difference, which is where we, we put a, a call out to our 53,000 employees and say, OK, who, which of you have got growth mindsets, you're curious, and you want to solve problems for the company? And typically, a lot of the very younger generation, but not exclusively, mm -hmm. sign up, and the rest of the organization sol sends problems. So we have kind of 800 problems that the organization would like solving and 20 or so at a time in three month stints in an agile working environment. It's a very cool, creative environment that we put them in. They solve problems. And most importantly, they're given the autonomy to do it. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we say, yeah, we don't really like what you've done. It's, this is, these are the problems that people who are like you in the business want addressing. How can you help? And it's utterly fantastic. And to be in that environment, it's incredibly dynamic and rich. Mm -hmm. And you can really feel a creativity. So that message gets out to the rest of the organization around how creative you really can be. I think the, uh, yeah, it's, for me, it, it really boils down to giving them meaningful work. And as, and as soon as they join, if they can really contribute to the organization and, and in, a, in a smaller organization, as they mentioned, our hierarchy is very flat. So we have a very you know, open door policy. You get to know the, the, the COO very, very quickly, you get to know me very quickly, you can walk into any office and, and ask a question. And I think that's what they like, is this notion, if I'm here, I can do something, I, I matter, I, I mean something, and I'm taken seriously. So it's, uh, it's, it's for me, the, the, the ability to have creativity, you know, stem from asking ideas, giving them work to own work something, and also contribute and feel that that's valued. Right, and a final word from PwC. Our people value proposition is grow your own way. So we really ask from everyone to bring in their ideas and to shape, um, to, to shape our future together. Mm -hmm. We have just um, formed a future council comprising of millennials with the idea that we discuss um, specific decisions, specific problems, specific views with them and get their, get their inputs. And um, I think this is also giving them uh, a voice. Giving them a voice, exactly. But nobody has set up any foosball tables or, <laughs> or bean bags or <laughs> in their offices. We, we ha you, you can have those. I think they're great, you know, that they allow the, the ideas to come through. But I think it's really actually what, what are the actions you have that allow them to contribute. That, that they do for the other 99% yeah. of the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us today. This was, this great. was really, Thank really you. interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Summer is approaching and the Swiss outdoors is calling. But what if you're still struggling to shake off the winter blues? Well, our guest in our Feeling Good program tonight has some top tips on getting energized. Stay tuned. The Swiss summer is just around the corner as are plenty of chances to embrace the great outdoors. 
But if you're still flagging a little, then tonight we have some advice. The founder of BoostingNow.com says it's possible to find more energy, even without having to do a lot of fitness. Here's tonight's Feeling Good. Now, Barbara, just when I met you, this energy that you seem to have that's just glowing and oozing from you is rather infectious. What's your secret? Well, that's a bit of a cliche as well for me to answer, but I think my real secret is that I'm very passionate about the things that I do. So I love what I do, and I love the life that I live. And I have my bad days as well, but that's, that's I think, the it's secret. It's not always easy, though, to no. do what we love. That's probably no. one of the main problems. So how Absolutely. do we sort of get it to a point where we love every minute of our day? Yeah. Is that possible, even? No, we don't. You d so, so let it go, because you're not going to get to that point. You're not going to get to a point where you love every minute of machine. the day. <laughs> no. <laughs> However, um, and I think that's also a bit difficult in the current days, where we all say it's about finding your passion, go for your passion, and now I'm lucky uh, saying I can do what I love. But it's been, it's been hard work to get there. So it's also about making it very small, making it very practical, and saying, hey, maybe just start by bringing some focus in your day and finding out what are actually the things that give a smile on your face. And generally speaking, it's logic that we need energy to be able to yeah. fuel our bodies, to do things, to yeah. do the things we do. Uh, can you calculate energy levels? How does that work? How do you assess? Yeah, well, you can definitely. There are so many things, so many ways and trackers that you can use to, to measure energy. Uh, and there's also, I mean, energy is about ATP, which is a little powerhouse in your body and your mind. It's in your brain cells as well. ATP. ATP. It, what does yeah. that sound for? Yeah, so that really is your the molecules that are in your body um, and that generate energy. So it's a little power. It's a very, uh, I won't go into all the technical details, but it's a little powerhouse in your body that makes sure that your muscles can function, that your, uh, your body is actually functioning. Um, so you can measure that. However, that's very technical and you really need the experts for that. So what we really believe in is asking people, how energetic do you feel? Uh, what did you do the past month, the past weeks? Uh, how much sleep did you get? How much water did you drink? All those elements that really uh, generate energy, you can ask people for that and then you get a, a rather... A sensible idea about how the energy level is. And what are the patterns in terms of age groups and sexes and races? Does it really vary? Because we often say something like, oh, I wouldn't have the energy for yeah. that in my 40s or my 50s or my yes. 60s. Is that true? Yeah. Well, there are absolutely, there are lifestyle factors and there are biological factors. So the lifestyle factors is what you can change yourself, right? It's not easy, but there, those are things that you can change. The biological factors are things like age, genetics, hormones, circadian rhythms, and those are the things that you can still also affect with lifestyle. However, these are also things just the way they are. Uh, so over age, with hormones, with differences in your uh, circadian rhythms, your sleep and wake cycle, there are definitely things that uh, change over the years. And your, in your experience, what really sucks energy, sucks the life out of us, that we feel like, yeah. oh. Yeah. You can't be bothered. Yes. Uh, negativity. Uh, so being around uh, people that ask negative energy from you, hearing negative things. So that's one. But maybe even more important is not being in control or having the feeling of not being in control. And then, then I don't mean being in control that you have your Excel sheets and you make your project plannings, though not that kind of control, but control over your life, that you actually have the feeling that you can choose what you're doing and that you actually make the right choices there. So then we talk about fitness and energy becoming like an anchor yeah. to, to go about our daily life. Absolutely. I think once you have set your routines and made it a, a habit and really made it part of your daily life, then they become their anchors. And I think people who are far away from that, they would never see that as their anchors. I had an interesting conversation today about emails and how draining yes. emails are, how yeah. long they take to write. You disturb your colleagues, you get forward emails, forwarded and ping pong Absolutely. back and forth, and then you've got like 500 in your inbox unanswered. Yeah. How do you get rid of emails and negative people? 
Ooh. <laughs> well, the thing with emails, I think that's a very good example because it's actually what I just said about being in control. Emails is exactly the same as, let's say, 20 years ago, you would be working, you'd be in your office, and non-stop somebody would run in and ask, may I ask you this? May I ask you this? You would go absolutely crazy. And that's the same what we do with our emails. We think that we have to respond right away. So actually, you're never doing what you actually want to do or what you plan to do. So emails is very much about discipline, making your discipline that way that you only answer them in between certain brackets or in between uh, those times that you have planned for emails. And do you find a pattern in uh, the friendships you keep, the relationships you have? Do you have similar energy levels with those people? No, very different. Very different because energy is also something that you take from the other person, right? You have you have, well, what they say, there's a lot of literature about this, but you have the so-called pluggers, people that come to you, just plug in <laughs> there, you see it, you see it, right? And then after an evening, you feel like, oh God, everything, the energy is just out because um, there's just a very different re uh, energy level from yours. And you have givers, the people who, who actually give you a lot of, uh, of energy. So there's very different energy levels at different people. And in terms of looking at uh, lifestyle and a recipe to fill that good energy, that changes too, right? I mean, what was fitting for one season two years ago might not fit to you two years later. I hope so. I hope so because it means that we're developing, right? And that we're growing and that we're learning. So definitely it is something to... So that's why we always say, and also when we go to to companies where we do the, the programs, we always say it is about knowing your own body uh, and also knowing how you respond to things. If you're just on the go, non-stop, and you cannot actually listen to what your body or your mind is telling you, then you also don't know what is giving you energy. So it's very much something about being in touch and being connected with your In own Switzerland, body. are we good at connecting with our bodies, do you think? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> if not you're employed, sure. probably no, not. <laughs> no, not sure. Well, I think in, in any, uh, any corporate environment, it's, it's rather difficult because there's a high pressure, high performance. So, so I think it's I, I myself come from consultancy and it's not necessarily what people are doing all day. Um, however, I do think that it's getting more and more important. If you look at, the, at just the numbers here in Switzerland, there's a 40% of the employees, they feel long-term burnout or, or weakness uh, um, that is there. I mean, that costs so much. It costs, I think they calculated it, it costs the economy every year almost 7 billion Swiss francs. How do we prevent burnout then? Yeah. Can it be prevented? Well, I think the most important thing is that we acknowledge it. So it starts with awareness. Is there, burnout is not about weak people. Burnout is, is about not having the right match of what you're doing and what you want to do. Uh, very simply said. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot to say, more to say about that. But it's, yeah, talking about being prevented, I think step one is being aware about uh, of it and then getting your people engaged. I think if you have highly engaged people, and again, 75% of the Swiss employees are not engaged in their company and what they're doing, 70%, 75%. So having highly engaged people, that is a big, big risk, or, or at least a big uh, predictor that the burnout numbers will go down. So surely, I mean, looking after energy levels of employees is good for the company and good for the individual. Absolutely. Are companies enough, are doing enough to ensure that well-being and energy levels are as they should be? No. No. I mean, you see the token bowl of fruit now and then, a Absolutely. meditation it's, course. Exactly. But... but it's all a bit pieces there, pieces there, and, and really offering a holistic program where you say, hey, you know what, it's in our own interest as a company to put the employees, to take care of our employees. And it's actually, I mean, there's been, by now there's been so many business cases and, and it's, it's hard numbers, it's 21% profitability what goes up if you have highly engaged people, if you have an environment where people really are being taken care of. And of course, it is about finding the balance between it's the own re responsibility of employees and it's the responsibility of companies. However, you can really well um, uh, stimulate this culture where you think, hey, it's, it's totally normal. It's okay to take care of yourself. It's okay to turn off your phone after 11 uh, and, and more of those kind of things. And your belief is that many of us are underperforming. We're actually shortchanging ourselves in terms of our Absolutely. potential and how... Yes great we can be um, but we're all unique so would you is it fair to say that everyone has a different energy level a maximum yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We're all unique in that. Everybody has it. Uh, uh, one floor is in the morning, the other in the in the evening. I mean, there there's a lot of differences there. So it's very much not, I have a lot of energy and it's not about everybody getting to the same energy level as I have. It is very much, but again, you have to know yourself in order to even know where your M M energy limitations are. And it's also about finding out about you as an individual and what relaxes you, what helps Absolutely. to restore the energy. Uh, how do you work with people to find out their thing? What re yeah. really makes them yeah, work at their best? Yeah, what makes them tick or yeah. makes them work at their best? Well, I think there are two important things. Being able to relax and unwind and, and even allowing that uh, uh, to, to relax after uh, a day full of stress, for example. A lot of times when there is a day full of stress, afterwards you go looking for more adrenaline, right? Or more stimulants. So you either go online shopping or you go for alcohol or you go out <laughs> for all kinds of other things. But that doesn't lower your adrenaline. Um, so you, you will never give you... And that's actually dangerous for your health uh, if you're not able to, to lower those stress levels. So that's one... And, and, and finding the right way that works for you personally... However, there is, of course, a lot of research already that going on your mobile phone is not the way that relaxes in the long run. Uh, yeah, so, th so that's an important one. Is there a nation out there that you believe have got it right? Not a whole nation, I think. Well, they always say that Bhutan is this, they have their <laughs> index of happiness, right? So there are some examples there. Uh, and there are some islands in, in the, uh, the Pacific where they also do really well on, on those kind of things. But no, I, I, I wouldn't say. But we are super busy. Super, How yeah. do we just take the time to take care of ourselves, to pamper ourselves, indulge ourselves? Yeah, it starts by, um, I think, really big mind shift that sleeping or taking care of yourself is not about laziness or about weakness. Actually, you're a very strong person if you take care of yourself and if you prioritize that because you can outperform the next time again. So I think it's really, it's what, um, uh, what also in the book, The Sleep Rev uh, Revolution have been mentioned, saying, okay, we had the industrial revolution and we said, and there we worked so hard in being available available non-stop and now we have to learn that we're burning out ourselves uh, and on a meta level also the whole, whole society if we do not learn how to rest and to stop and unplug. The best thing for me about going on a vacation on a holiday is just switching off a phone, yes, right. not having email contact and that for me relieves so much stress and tension. I think I'm already feeling better. Yeah. Is that a general thing that you come across? Absolutely. It's a very general thing. There's a lot of uh, companies by now also have, maybe for other reasons, but they also have their um, uh, the regulations that you need to be offline for one or two weeks. Um, and people find it so freeing that they're like, oh, that, that is amazing. And I think if you already have that sensation, then it's definitely something that you, that to work on, to think about, because then maybe, hey, why only do it twice a year? Uh, or maybe you're going on holiday three times a year, but maybe why, why not incorporate it in your own life on a daily basis and get that feeling during the normal week as well? How do you convince some of these corporate people yeah. to get on board with you know, finding their energy, finding their... <laughs> Depends a bit where they're at at their moments. You always have to meet the company where they're at, right? I, I ver I'm very passionate about what I do, but I try also not to preach and start to say, like, this is what you're supposed to do. So I believe by making it fun, that's one thing, by really being inspiring and motivating instead of you have to do this or you have to do that. And convincing companies is, is easy when you show them the numbers. If you show them like, hey, this is, this is what's in there for you, the, 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 your profit, your performance, they will go up. And, and what we also see with our, our programs, we see like even if in three months of a program, you see that people about 80% changes habits. So they already start changing routines. Uh, by showing companies that, then um, uh, uh, that should be enough. And any future trends that you're seeing, the direction that we're moving in for the good or for the bad? Yeah, well, I hope, but I'm a positive person, but I very much hope you see and 
read and, and, and hear a lot about the, that people start acknowledging what the effect of sleep is and the lack of sleep and sleep de being sleep deprived, um, what the effect also is on organizational performance. So I, I really hope with those numbers and with that research, I really hope that, um, uh, that companies will put their well-being program and their engagement program really top priority. And not only because they think that they will keep their people for a longer time, but because they really see that there is no other option, actually. Because they care. And any of these gadgets and that, I mean, are they are they effective? Like you track your sleep, for yeah. example. But... Well, they are. They they are effective, uh, and they're a nice gimmick, and they're nice to do. And that is, if that inspires you, and if you're, for example, performance driven, then a lot of time you're like, oh, I want to do better. I want to do better. But it's not building a long-lasting routine. The long-lasting routine, I believe, only comes when you connect your health goals, your fitness goals, when you connect them to more life goals. So if you say, I want to sleep better, or I want to lose weight, or these kind of, just because, you won't build, you won't, when it gets, when the going gets tough, you stop, right? But when you really have a clear picture why you want to do it and where it's going to bring your life, then you will be motivated and you won't need me anymore for that. So integrate it into your life, don't just have it as a quick fix or Absolutely, quick, no quick fixes. Quick yes. Barbara, thank you so much. Well, welcome, mm -hmm. thank you. All right, and that is it for us here tonight on The Newsmaker. Remember, if you have, want to rewatch something or if there's something that you missed, you can always find our content on cnnmoney.ch. The Newsmaker is up next with Hannah Wise. You don't want to miss it. Meanwhile, I'm Ana Maria Montero. Thank you so much for being with me, and we'll see you right back here tomorrow. Have a good night. CNN Money Switzerland weather. We start with the webcam of the day. Here is an overview of the values recorded in the last hours. And now the radar animation of the last 90 minutes. Let's have a look to the forecast for this afternoon. And for tomorrow. Here is an overview for the next days in German-speaking Switzerland. In Western Switzerland, and south of the Alps. Thanks for following us. Our newsmaker tonight is none other than political cartoonist Patrick Chapat, published in the NZZ, New York Times and Le Ton. Tonight, ahead of World Press Freedom Day, he tells us what it means to work in the era of Donald Trump. We're all playing in his hand. Either we, it doesn't matter if, if you're uh, with him or against him, we're all talking about him. He's sucking up all the oxygen in the media and I'm part of the problem because I've been doing so many cartoons on him. And it's the comeback story of the year so far. Tech stocks show no sign of wear as the golden earnings season continues. That and the big Swiss story of the day, Nestle, coming up. Good evening, I'm Hannah Wise and you're watching the Newsmaker here on the Swiss Pulse.
Good evening and welcome back. This is the Newsmaker Hour here on the Swiss Pulse. Let's start with the main news headlines. Nestle has ended a two-month price dispute with European grocers this Wednesday. The action has kept hundreds of Nestle products off the shelves. No details are available on the deal, but John Cox, an analyst at Kepler Chevro, who we spoke to earlier, said retailers are unlikely to have are likely to have secured better price conditions, while Nestle potentially got more shelf space or increased volumes. Consumer confidence weakened last month in Switzerland, according to new data from the State Secretariat for Economic Affairs. SECO said that expectations regarding future economic growth were less optimistic than in January, but the outlook for the coming months was for a positive trend. There was also some optimism regarding the labour market, with further improvements to unemployment expected this year. The EU is looking to fill the monetary gap left by Britain leaving the bloc next year with funds from plastics, CO2 and corporate tax. The new funds will amount to €22 billion Euros per year, or around 12% of the total EU budget. Well, meanwhile, in Brexit news today, UK Prime Minister Theresa May met with her inner circle in the Brexit War Cabinet to set out the UK's course out of the EU. The most explosive topic? what to do about the Irish border and the future customs arrangements between the UK and the EU. Unless a satisfactory answer can be found soon, it could be enough to derail the negotiations, leaving Britain out of the bloc with no meaningful deal at all. The 48th St Gallen Symposium kicks off today, the theme beyond the end of work. The symposium is organised by students at the University of St Gallen. On Thursday, we talked to three generations of leaders with special interviews from the event this coming Friday. Look out for our exclusive digital content as we follow this event all week. All right, after the break, on the eve of World Press Freedom Day, we speak to Swiss political cartoonist Patrick Chapat on what it means to work in the age of fake news and growing threats to journalists. CNN Money Switzerland weather. We start with the webcam of the day. Here is an overview of the values recorded in the last hours. And now the radar animation of the last 90 minutes. Let's have a look to the forecast for this afternoon. And for tomorrow. Here is an overview for the next days in German-speaking Switzerland. In Western Switzerland, and south of the Alps. Thanks for following us. Welcome back. They get to poke fun at the world's leaders. But while political cartoonists have a unique take on the world, they also have important points to make. Tonight, our newsmaker is Patrick Chapat, well known for his work in the New York Times, Le Ton, and the NZZ. He's also part of Cartooning for Peace, a foundation supporting cartoonists. Ahead of Press Freedom Day, Martina Fuchs caught up with him to discuss how important that freedom really is. Well, it's, it's more important than ever. Uh, to, to, to salute the press, and in our case, to salute cartoonists uh, doing their job of uh, you know, speaking truth to power. Um, it's more important than ever, especially in these very days, as we are speaking, just uh, a few days ago, March 26, we learned that uh, 
um, journalists, uh, 50, I think 15 journalists from uh, Chumumriyat, the Turkish opposition uh, newspaper, were sentenced to, I mean, heavy, heavy sentence in jail. One of them is, is a cartoonist. So, so it's very, sadly, very timely, more important than ever, um, to be, yeah, to be speaking truth to power and to be cartooning. This is the era of the strong man. We're seeing that in Turkey, and I'm, by the way, I would have never imagined when we started that uh, cartooning for peace foundation that we would be talking about a, a country so close to Europe. We could be talking about Eastern Europe. I mean, it's very close to us. Uh, the definition between democracy and non-democracies, this is changing. And it's not just the prison charges. I mean, since uh, you know the last 25 years, about 1,200 uh, reporters and journalists have been killed doing their job. Do you think that the situation is getting worse for journalists, reporters, but also for cartoonists? Of course it is. And as, as I'm saying, it is, it is getting worse and close to us. I think, I think Turkey is the worst case right now in terms of, uh, of journalists being in jail and being sentenced. And why is that? Is it because governments, you know, hate them and because they want to exert more political pressure or are they too outspoken against governments and politicians? It is because I'm afraid we're going through troubled times uh, and, and we, we're seeing more and more, uh, you know, power to the, to the, to the extremes, to the, to the extreme rights. To all those people, any extremes, just hate humor and hate the role of cartooning, which is to, again, speak truth and, and show things how they are. That's what a cartoon does. It shows the truth, you know, it, it shows the, the, um, the king naked. The emperor is naked in a cartoon. And, and, uh, and, and that is uh, less and less acceptable in many places around us. So we're seeing, indeed, um, cartoonists being targeted more and more, being put under pressure and, and not only on the other side of, of the world, but close to us. So you are the vice president of Cartooning for Peace. What is the goal of this group exactly? What are you trying to do against all of these trends? Well, it was born uh, as a network um, just after the Danish cartoons controversy 2006 with a meeting in New York with Kofi Annan and Plantu, my friend and colleague from Le Monde. Then we co-founded this foundation in Geneva. So the goal is, of course, to have a conversation between us, cartoonists, and with, with the public about that trauma that, that was the, the, the Danish cartoon controversy. I mean, we almost got into the Third World War because of cartoons. Uh, cartoonists became the sticking point of something, you know, between the West and, and Islam, between uh, the whole conversation uh, uh, between freedom of expression and religion and, and defamation, all, I mean, we became the center of attention. And then what happened in 2015, I don't need to tell you. Charlie Hebdo. Charlie Hebdo happened, and that was a sad, um, not unexpected follow-up of the Danish cartoons. We knew in our heart that uh, cartoonists would be targeted and maybe killed. Uh, even though you know it, when it happens, you cross a line. That line was crossed in blood. It became reality. I mean, people uh, killed cartoonists for an image, for a simple image. Yes, yeah, so we have this uh, foundation, Cartooning for Peace, and we've been awarding a prize since 2012, a prize for a cartoonist, not only for his work and talent, but for his courage. And uh, that went to Iranian cartoonists first, it went to a Syrian and an Egyptian cartoonist, and two years ago, we uh, saluted uh, two of our colleagues, one from Kenya, another one from Malaysia. And still, uh, because that uh, friend and cartoonist, Zunar, has been doing uh, very harsh cartoons about corruption in Malaysia at the highest level of power, and is still awaiting trial, he risked 49 years in jail. So that, that's what it means to be a cartoonist in some places in the world. What has changed for you since then? What has changed is that you realize that um, the, the threat is not only on the other side of the world, it might be on the corner of the street. Uh, so what has changed is that you just experience a little bit, because still, I mean, I still feel safe uh, here in Geneva. But have you come under attack, uh, physical no, or verbal, no, or have you no. received threats? No, what has changed is that you share a little bit of the fate of 
What cartoonists have been um, experiencing every day in, in third world countries, in countries where you know democracy is not ideal or not present at all, and they've been doing this job, and that's the, ex exactly the reason why we established that prize, is to salute them. We're just sharing a bit more of their fate. And what it has changed for me is that the world has shrunk, because I love to go, uh, as much as I love doing my cartoons, I like to go out and report as a journalist uh, with comics, you know, comics journalism, which is something that has become bigger and bigger. I've been to, I mean, I've, I've done maybe 30 reports all over the world, and I must say some of the places I went to are places I would not go today. So the world has shrunk. Still, uh, Switzerland maintains a very high scoring when it comes to press freedom. It ranks uh, seventh, according to uh, Reporters Without Border, on uh, this uh, index uh, of press freedom. Would you think Seven. this is accurate, uh, or do you place it much lower? Who are the first six? <laughs> it's always, you know, come on, Switzerland is not first. <laughs> it's like the, the happiness index, we're not first. <laughs> but do you feel that press freedom is coming under threat here in the country as well? Uh, okay, we're doing okay. Uh, we're doing okay. Compared to others? Yes. yes. We can't complain. I think it's, it's, it's quite a safe place to, to be doing this uh, work. Uh, I think it's uh, just hard to get some information in Switzerland because of the, the culture. Uh, in, in parts of the administration, uh, and, and, and people speak less and less, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, you have more and more public relations people, you have less and less access to the real news, and that's, that's always been bad in Switzerland, I think. And, you know, concentration of the media is not a good thing, it's not a good thing for journalists, it's not a good thing for cartoonists, because if you have a, a bad time with your employer, where will you go next? What do you think is the responsibility of a political cartoonist like you in terms of upholding press freedom? What is your uh, duty? It's not your, it's your responsibility, but it's your job. I mean, your job is to test uh, the limits of, of, of what you can say and the way you can say it. Uh, you do it at different levels. I'm not working for satirical uh, media like Charlie Hebdo. I'm not doing the same kind of work. I think it's their work and their job to be, you know, provoking and testing all limits as a society in some regards, even though they, they're not always good. And how far can you go in terms of provoking? And I work for mainstream newspapers and, and, and it's also my character. I'm not trying to provoke at any cost. I'm trying to, to make a point and I'm trying to be right on target. You don't need to, sh to, 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 you know, to, to shout very loudly, you need to be right on target. That's my goal. Sometimes, you know, it, it can, in the process, it can shock people. And that's the issue today, you know, it's not, it's not censorship, it's not terrorism, it's people have, have a thinner and thinner skin. I mean, they get shocked by many things, they react on social media, they start social media campaigns for, for everything and anything. Come on. You, we need to be able to, you know, to, be, to look at criticism and, 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 and to put ourselves you know, in, in question. So with less acceptance and maybe also with you know, more physical and verbal attacks against uh, cartoonists, do you feel that there is more um, limited space and you're more constrained in terms of presenting the realities? I just see a risk uh, in this uh, social media world. Uh, you know, this uh, moralism that we see everywhere uh, with, uh, with moral fights. Uh, I mean, if you, if, you start tar if you start looking at caricature, every caricature will shock someone. And so you could start a campaign on every single cartoon and you would not be able to be doing this job if we... So it, it's about us as a society, it's about editors, it's about the media. Very, I, mean, I think they tend to uh, apologize very quick when they get, you know, a lot of social media uh, storm, uh, and, and, uh, and that's the problem. With uh, social media, there, that there is a new wave of kind of self-censorship even. I think there is a new way of actually organizing uh, campaigns, uh, and they, they seem like you know, uh, just people reacting, but very often it's organized by groups. It happened to some of my US colleagues. Uh, they got they got really bad, uh, you know, hate hate mail and campaigns. It happened to Matt Matt Worker of Politico on a cartoon he did about the Texas floods, 
And it's, it's hard, and, and it happened to, to, to uh, another friend from the Los Angeles Times who's now leaving the newspaper. And I'm thinking he got under so much pressure at some point with his editor that he looked for another opportunity and left the newspaper. So this is having consequences. consequences. And, and, and uh, we need to be courageous, and we need to be many to be courageous. It doesn't take just one cartoonist. It takes an editor, it takes a group. You work for very prestigious uh, newspapers and publications as well, Le Temps, NZZ, uh, New York Times. Have you come, you know, under criticism from the readership as well, received hate mails, or are you kind of, you know, free so far? Well, yes, yeah, sometimes I get, I get funny, funny mails, <laughs> um, especially if you're uh, uh, talking to a large audience like the New York Times and their international editions, which are in, I don't know how many, more than 100 countries, you don't control the way, <coughs> you don't control the way uh, this or that cartoon will be uh, you know, seen and understood. The only thing you can control is your intentions and your honesty in what you put in that cartoon. But you can't control the way it's going to be received. So I get some, yeah, sometimes even from the US, uh, you know, charged emails. Uh, once uh, someone found out, I was uh, right now currently living in Geneva, and he said, keep on doing your stupid little curtains in your tiny gay country. Somehow, <laughs> I don't know why, he's so Switzerland, like that. All right, we'll have more of that interview with Patrick Chapat right after the break when he tells us about his work and what Trump's presidency means for him. Welcome back to The Newsmaker. Monday this week was the deadliest day for journalists since the Charlie Hebdo attacks in Paris in 2015. Nine journalists were killed in an attack in Kabul, Afghanistan. So on the eve of World Press Freedom Day, there may be little to celebrate. Swiss editorial cartoonist Patrick Chapat works with international publications, including The New York Times, Le Temps and The NZZ. In the second part of this interview with him, Martina Fuchs asks what the role of a political cartoonist was in today's frenzied news world. Well, I think a, a political cartoonist um, has to give his view on, on what's happening in the world. So it has to be opinionated. And uh, so his role, my role as I see it, is to, to be as, um, as honest about myself as I can and, and really say the things as they are, as, the, as I see them. So one of our role is just to show things as they are and to show the contradictions in life. And I can tell you, contradictions abound in every aspect of our life. You don't, you don't need to look at politics. Just look at ourselves and our smartphones and our moral uh, you know, intentions. And we contradict ourselves so much as consumers every day, every hour, every minute. So all those contradictions are material for cartooning. Now recently a pair of uh, reporters won the uh, Pulitzer Prize for a piece that they wrote for the New York Times about Syrian immigrants uh, in the US. Uh, what does all of that mean? Well, it means a lot especially to me because uh, in May 2016 I actually uh, was proud to introduce comics journalism to the New York Times with a series that we did with my wife and Frederick Whitman about death row. So it was a five part series inside death row that you can still see on, on their website. And that was one year of work uh, visiting high security prisons across the US. So that was the first time that, uh, that uh, the New York Times opened itself to comics journalism. And the next year, uh, I, I, we kind of paved the way for that. And the next year, you had those uh, two, um, one cartoonist, one journalist, who came up with, with that beautiful series, uh, Welcome uh, to the New World, uh, following uh, uh, an immigrant family into the US. And they are arriving the day Trump is elected. And that's comic journalism. So it's, it's a beautiful recognition uh, for that genre of uh, comics journalism, which which is becoming bigger and bigger. You travel a lot. You were just in India as part of the anniversary celebrations to uh, you know, celebrate the uh, India-Swiss relations. Uh, you've also traveled to Gaza and many other places. Probably something that people do not expect from a cartoonist. What does 
travel maybe um, mean to you and how much of an inspiration is it for your work? Oh, it means a lot. It means getting out from this place where I'm, you know, most of the time I'm here at my desk, uh, throwing my arrows at whatever uh, the news is and the people in the news are. And after a while, I really get the need to get out and see the places and the faces and, 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 and the things that are in the news. So I do this through comics journalism. Uh, and I, I act like, like a reporter. I, I go and I make interviews just the way you do, and I take pictures, and then when I come back, I draw. And I also do that through conferences and just meeting people. How uh, strong is the network actually globally among the cartoonists? Do you have well, like a very strong community? So Cartooning for Peace is one network, and, and that, that, that helps. Otherwise, we don't know, I mean, I didn't know uh, Indian cartoonist colleagues before I, I traveled there. So that was a good, good excuse to, to make that trip. But we are a kind of a, kind of a family. Um, I've been also organizing uh, other projects, uh, my own projects. It's called Crossed Pens with uh, the help of the Swiss Foreign Affairs. And that's going to places of conflict and interacting and working with cartoonists there because very often in a given uh, uh, place and context, like if you take Ivory Coast um, during the rebellion, where you had the rebels in the north, if you take Kenya and you know, the ethnicity issue, so you have divided communities and each of those communities has a newspaper and each of those newspapers has a cartoonist. So you run the risk of being used as a tool of propaganda as a cartoonist against the other camp and that's my I've been obsessed by that idea that um, we must not be, I mean, caricature is a very strong tool. It's a powerful weapon. It can be a weapon. We must not be uh, doing propaganda. That's not what editorial cartoon is about. So that's why I've been traveling also to, to, to do these projects. Do you adapt your style a little bit, you know, according to which publication you make your cartoons for? Well, I think I have only one brain. I haven't checked that, but uh, so I do think I have only one brain. So I'm not trying to adapt, but you need to speak to an audience. So I need to test. I like to, to do sketches and send the sketches and I, I, I ask for a vote. That's what I do. That's for your editors and then they give you feedback? A group feedback? of people um, at Le Temps, NZZ, uh, New York Times, it's the same practice. So I ask for different, for votes. What do you think? First, second, third. So I don't ask them to pick the best cartoon for me, but through that um, feedback, I can see what doesn't work. That's important because a cartoon has to work like this. And, and, uh, and I can also see what doesn't, I mean, English is not my mother language, so as you can tell. So I can also see what, you know, with the New York Times, what doesn't work in the wording or the idea. So I test myself. Do you sometimes get uh, work sent back to you because it's politically too strong? It might happen, but you know what? You would be surprised that the opposite can happen. Like... You're was, too soft. And I, I remember having a, an idea, one of those sketches that I sent about Trump when he was campaigning. So we're talking about uh, 2016, end of 2016. And I came up with that idea comparing uh, with uh, before and now, and you had the Ku Klux Klan on the left, a pa an image from the past. Then you had Trump and his hairdo was like, you know, like those hats. And they, the New York Times wanted that cartoon. They said, yeah, that's the, that's the right thing. That's the right idea. That's the best one. And I thought, ah, wait a minute. I think that's a bit too, too much. Too much. It's too much. Let's, let's, and I had another good one. And I said, let's keep this one. Let's see if we, we might need, you know. And did they use it again? Of course. I mean, a few months after that, you know, the, the leader of the Ku Klux Klan uh, supported Trump, which, who didn't want to disavow him, and then I had this cartoon and we published it. So I was the one who, you know, put some re restraint and, 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 and so it goes both ways. So how do you actually pick and select a story and how much can you assume that people know about that and its background as well? Um, I think for the last year and a half, I've been doing Trump all the time for the New York Times. So Do you have an overdose? I, I assume people <laughs> know about that story. And, and uh, no, you, you have to pick a story that will be in people's minds. 
they don't because there's no headline very often uh, on my cartoon so you need to understand what it is about very kind of quickly and i don't like to put too many words to describe what the situation is so it has to be obvious and then that allows you to go further and to give your uh, view and express your opinion but trump has been in the news and in the headlines all the time and really yeah. dominated this space. Uh, is it a bit too much for you and do you not have time for other interesting subjects now? It is, it is too much for all of us and uh, we're all playing in his hand. Either we, it doesn't matter if, if you're uh, with him or against him, we're all talking about him. He's sucking up all the oxygen in the media and I'm part of the problem because I've been doing so many cartoons on him. But you cannot get out. And even worse, I start with a, with a subject in the morning, I send my sketches, I do the final cartoon. By the time I send that to the New York Times in the evening, I'm past two uh, crazy stories, crazy Trump stories that happened the same day. I mean, the cycle is, uh, nobody has seen that. I mean, the White House correspondents are just worn out. It's, it's it, he's, again, uh, sucking up all the oxygen. And it's hard to, to not mention those stories because they're so big and impactful. And very often it's not even what he says, it's what's happening behind, it's the politics that we're not paying attention to and it's, maybe it's part of the plot, you know? He's, he's tweeting something stupid at the same time, his majority is passing measures that will have implications for the next 20 years. How much does it bother you to be part of this machine and do you plan an exit? Can you? <laughs> You mean without I, losing your job? I plan an exit of Trump <laughs> at some point because we're going to be just too tired, <laughs> and it would be safe for uh, democracy, I, I think. Mm, no, I mean it's interesting, and uh, it is uh, the only way I know to digest uh, the news. I mean we're part of this world. There's no way. There's no other planet to 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 go to, and uh, so my way of of uh, you know. Um, digesting all the news of what's happening, the emotions, is to, to draw. And I think it's good for people as well. And to which extent do you believe that your cartoons can actually change public opinion? Not at all. <laughs> I don't think a cartoon has ever made anyone change his mind. But influence, for sure. I don't, I don't think so. I think a cartoon, the power of a cartoon that... I mean, the best compliment that I got is someone sees a cartoon and says, this is it. No, the yes, this is exactly it. And the power of showing in an image an idea or a situation, just sh being able to show that in to an image point. or one caption or two, that's very strong. So you have, you have the feeling as a reader that it's kind of a miracle when it works, You're like, wow, this is it. This is what I was thinking and I didn't know how to express it. So Patrick, uh, which are you know, the big business stories that you have covered and which do you see as the next big business stories for your <laughs> cartoon work? Well, as part of business, if you want, uh, I love to, I follow you know, the technology news a lot because I think that's, that's such a big part of our uh, lives and of our world of contradictions. So, um, the, you know, of course the the self-driving cars, that's a new world of uh, images and ideas and, 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 and situations we're getting into. <clears throat> you know, they found out that uh, 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 just a sticker on, 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 a, on a sign, like uh, on, on a street sign, can, can, uh, can totally hack the, the self-driving software and, and doesn't understand what's happening, where just uh, even, even the most stupid human driving would understand, oh, that's a sticker on a sign. So this is, it's fascinating. Those news are fascinating. Then we'll have uh, artificial intelligence, the robots, all of these, they're gonna change our lives. Health, every aspect of our life is being changed by uh, technology. And, and it's fascinating to see that uh, with social media and smartphones, we don't know how to teach our kids to, you know, to just experience those and live with these because we don't know ourselves how to deal with these. We are all teenagers. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a world of teenagers. We have talked a lot about Trump, Patrick. Is he your favorite uh, character to uh, depict or do you have another one? 
Well, he's the one I can't avoid, and, and, and the other one is the other guy with the funny hairdo, uh, Kim Jong Un. And since the two of them are going to meet, this is, I mean, this is a caricature come true, <laughs> Trump and Kim Jong Un meeting. But that's, yeah, those are the two uh, unavoidable figures. Do you have that uh, image, that cartoon in your mind already for the meeting? Well, I did a few of them. One of them was uh, Trump asking uh, Kim, uh, what kind of hair gel do you use? Really silly. Coming up, the FANG stocks are showing their teeth with no sign of stopping. After the break, we're looking at the tech stock comeback. Stay with us. Welcome back. It looks like Tommy mayonnaise and Maggie seasonings are back on the menu. After two months, Nestle has settled a price dispute with supermarket chains in Germany, Belgium and here in Switzerland. The deal means hundreds of products will be back on the shelves. But what does it tell us about the cutthroat business of grocery shopping? John Cox from Kepler Chevrolet explains. Yeah, I think basically the food retail environment or the the uh, environment for supermarkets is incredibly difficult. And as a result, supermarkets are looking for any ways they can get maybe better purchasing terms from some of their suppliers. And a group of companies bandy together, and, and part of that group was actually Switzerland's co-op in a group called Agecore, uh, and started negotiating centrally with Nestle uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and it's obviously been pretty tough negotiations. Uh, they, the, uh, the group of retailers actually removed some products Nestle products on their shelves, mm -hmm. just to sort of pressure um, a, uh, some sort of compromise. Uh, Mark Schneider, the new CEO of Nestle, has actually said, yes, um, there are some price differentials across national boundaries. Maybe th those price differentials were narrow, um, but we don't want to just give away pricing for the sake of it, and we want a, a sort of a, a, an agreement which is um, acceptable for I, both parties. And I yeah. guess there's a reason why they're all being pretty tight-lipped about this deal, because, you know, you've got the potential for other uh, groups to kind of jump on the bandwagon here. Yeah. No, definitely. Uh, and I think, actually, uh, Age Core was established as part of uh, another group uh, a year ago. We're doing a similar thing in the Benelux region, and we're quite successful. So I think you're going to see you're going to see more of this. Uh, and obviously, what, what they want to do is get lower prices, and in the case of someone like Nestle, that means, well, obviously your, your price is going to be lower. Um, and uh, in addition, that probably puts some pressure on your margin, particularly for the commoditized type of products where the price pressure is supposed to, is likely to be the fiercest. Uh, uh, what does this tell us about the supermarket industry right now? No, it's, it's really, really difficult. I think in, in the early 2000s, you had the emergence of the, uh, the discounters coming out of Germany. I think that was the first sort of shock, uh, shock to the sector. We had rising commodity prices at the end of the 2000s. That, that had, a, had an impact when some of these supermarkets realised they could no longer pass on uh, prices. And then more recently, we have the internet uh, and the shift to grocery shopping uh, online. Uh, and obviously, people are waiting for Amazon food to come into continental Europe. So this has really uh, you know, put the cat amongst the pigeons as far as food retailers are concerned. They're all very scared about what will mm. happen. Um, these sort of tough negotiations are bound to continue uh, in Europe for the foreseeable future. Well, you, you mentioned a couple of uh, the disruptors in the industry, Amazon, mm. Aldi, Lidl, the discount stores. Mm. But what about this deal in the United Kingdom between Sainsbury's and Asda? Mm. Uh, they're buying Asda Walmart for $10 billion. I mm. mean, how... How does that change the landscape? I mean, presumably they're going to have even more buying power and even more influence when it comes to companies mm. like Nestle. Mm. No, definitely. I think, um, you know, the UK is an example where you've seen the, the sort of discounters coming in the last couple of years, uh, the normal high street guys starting to struggle, uh, and they've decided to consolidate. And the first thing they're going to do is turn around to their suppliers, the FMCGs, Nestle included, but the beverages makers, the home and personal care guys, and say, look, you know, we're bigger now, we can buy more from you. Um, you know, what can you do for us? Uh, and that will certainly put pressure on prices as well going down the road. And how much is a company like Nestle hit when something like this comes along? I mean, is this kind of thing built into their business plan? Yeah, I think, if you again, if you look in the early 2000s when the discounters first emerged, they, they were at a bit of a loss about mm. what to do. Over the coming years, then, they started to develop 
you know, different package sizes. So the packaging would be bigger, so they would get maybe better volumes, even though the pricing was under, under pressure. So organic sales growth would still remain relatively robust and the profitability of the business would remain robust. And this is what I think will happen, um, you know, if they, they negotiate to lower prices, if these retailers have been successful. In some, some brands, remember, it's not going to be the whole thing. Mm-hmm. You know, where Nestle has pricing power, uh, maybe in infant nutrition, uh, in pet care, just, just as an example, you know, you wouldn't expect too much pressure on prices. But maybe things like the Maggie products, um, and we know the Tommy products mm-hmm. in mayonnaise mm-hmm. here in, uh, uh, obviously, Switzerland, you know, there, there's a lot of competition in, in mayonnaise uh, with Maggie of Knorr on the other side. So, you know, these are the products that are probably going to see the price movements, not necessarily uh, the, the sort of the higher, um, the higher value add products. Uh, you mentioned some places at Nestle's uh, still making uh, growth in the pet food, the baby right. food. And Asia as well, they're still, you know, pushing the Asian market. Yeah. No, I think uh, emerging markets have actually come back pretty well for Nestle. Um, Asia and China, which is Mm. the second biggest market in the world, uh, basically uh, has come back in the last couple of quarters. And actually, we've seen signs of stabilisation in in the Americas, not necessarily all of Latin America, but even in North America has been pretty decent. Where the issue has been is is price pressure in Europe. We've already seen it. Mm -hmm. Um, Western Europe is probably about 20% of group revenues. I'd imagine that pricing pressure will will continue. Hopefully they can offset it in emerging markets. Remember as well, they have a big cost-cutting program going on, um, a lot of it in Europe. Uh, And I think, um, you know, they should be able to offset this pressure. But it just shows that getting to that medium-term target they have uh, down the road is going to be more difficult than maybe people anticipate. And focusing in on on Switzerland, what's price pressure like Mm. here? It's, pr- it's very tough. Um, obviously, what, what you saw in the last couple of years when uh, the euro fell mm-hmm. almost one-to-one against the Swiss franc, you've got people living on the borders. They're actually going you know, into France, into Germany, into Italy, Austria, etc., buying the products there because the average basket size is probably 20 30% uh, cheaper. This put a lot of pressure on the overall uh, retail space. No the strengthening s- frank then, sorry, the weakening frank. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is that, is that, do you think that balance will change? You'll see more shoppers staying in Switzerland? I, I think so, but there'll always be that price differential. Obviously, Switzerland is a very rich country, uh, an island in the middle of mm. Europe, uh, and prices will be more expensive here compared to what's happening uh, in neighbouring countries. But certainly the weakness of the Swiss franc helps, um, will help the local retailers. People maybe think, well, why bother driving for an hour? Um, you know, I'll just go around to the co-op or, or the Migro. So that should help the local players. And just finally, how do you see the landscape of uh, the grocery industry here in Switzerland developing? You've mentioned cross-border, but what about internet shopping? I mean, you know, co-op obviously has a lot of buying, buying power with being part of Agecore. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, these, these two companies uh, probably account for 70 80% of the, the, you know, the Swiss mm. retail market. Um, I think it's important they stay relevant. Um, you've seen in the case of uh, Migro Le Shop, uh, they have an internet offering, um, and as long as it's competitive, then I can't see why they will be, you know, left behind. Migro has its own, obviously, private label uh, range as well, very well respected. You know, even when Amazon Food comes into Switzerland, um, provided they, they, they're competitive, provided they have their own internet platforms, you know, they, they should be uh, okay. But obviously, any increased competition is not necessarily a good thing for the incumbents. All right, John Cox, thank you very much indeed. Very interesting, thank you. Now, it's been the comeback story of the year so far. Tech stocks show no sign of wear as the golden earnings season continues. Earlier, I caught up with Swissquote's head of market strategy, Peter Rosenstreich, for more. And we're going to start with Facebook. How are you feeling about this new dating feature? I'm obviously asking you in a professional capacity, of course. <laughs> yeah, I haven't used dating services in quite a while. But, uh, <laughs> the, the, the earnings speak for themselves. You know, the, the idea that this scandal had sort of rubbed off and started uh, pushing people out of the Facebook ecosystem uh, doesn't seem to be the case just yet, you know. Uh, so launching something like a, a dating service seems very natural. Uh, and, but, you know, overall, I think the erosion of confidence, uh, the, the, the worrying about privacy will continue to uh, weigh on people's opinion on Facebook and, and will always haunt them. Uh, so driving this business forward, I think, might be uh, complicated.
And what about the impacts on Tinder and WhatsApp? The announcement kind of really blew them out of the water that Facebook was making this expansion. Yeah, well, I mean, Facebook is a behemoth and it brings a, a enormous war, war chest, a huge technology capability, uh, and everything in its path uh, will probably tremble. Uh, we saw a similar reaction when Amazon uh, jumped into the fresh food space with uh, the acquisition of Whole Foods. And it's very similar uh, type of reaction when Facebook decides to move into a uh, uh, a sector or sort of a, a business. And that's what we're seeing right now. So we suspect that as Facebook's dating app picks up um, traction, we'll continue to see things like match uh, continue to weigh. And how are we seeing investors uh, using tech stocks now? I mean, there's been a lot of volatility uh, in the first part of this year. We've been seeing tech stocks up and down a little bit, not to mention the Facebook data uh, situation. But are people still uh, rushing to tech stocks? I think there's a little bit of a sort of a calming down period. I mean, we're seeing global PMI, so global growth indicators mm. come down. We're also hearing a lot of sort of this central bank exiting strategy and the idea that the days of uh, low interest rates are basically coming to an end. And therefore, the sort of risk appetite in equity investors are going to start to come down. And that ratio between sort of a dividend yield and sort of bond yields are going to get a significantly tighter. And therefore, people aren't going to sort of jump into uh, the type of yields and expectations in uh, the tech sector the way they did once before. Uh, but it's not all golden stories that are coming out of tech. We've been talking today about Snap. They've got 191 million users. However, that's still not enough for them. They're really kind of suffering right now. Well, I mean, with extended valuations, and it'd be very difficult to for anybody to sit here and say, you know, the um, the the IT sector, the high tech sector in the U.S. is not extended. Uh, they really need to produce extreme growth stories or solid revenues, and and things like Snap, uh, the story gets very weak in a hurry, um, and we could see how investors could uh, turn on it uh, very quickly, given the broader risk and headwinds. Let's move on to Apple because they've announced uh, a big buyback scheme uh, for investors today or recently anyway. Um, what's this telling you about where Apple is going? Well, I think, you know, it's, it's probably not as positive as uh, the market would have liked. You know, uh, the fact that Apple does not have anything innovative to do with their cash other than to buy back stocks and, and, and to keep it supported in that way, I think it's a very uh, negative sign for a historically extremely innovative company. You know, the question is, what else is on the pipeline? You know, where should they be putting their cash uh, by buying back stocks or, or innovative in the next iPad iPhone, uh, so on and so forth. So the fact that they're they're using their capital uh, for this type of uh, um, uh, strategy, I think, is worrisome for their sort of development pipeline. And where do you see Apple going? I mean, is there concern? Well, I mean, yeah, I think it is a concern. You know, the the innovation has been driving Apple. You know, it it, it hasn't been you know sort of stealing market share uh, through you know um, sort of uh, you know through a sort of a war of attrition. They, they've come in and created categories and that's how it's uh, built its business. Uh, and the question is, you know, without that next uh, development, without that new category that's going to dominate, that's going to change the, the IT environment uh, for the consumer, um, you know, stock just becomes sort of a, 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 a sort of a value trade and, and one that sort of will just sit in the marketplace. OK, well, it certainly sounds tough at the top when we come to talk about tech. Uh, let's move on to global trends now. The European economy is it's, it's on the slow. So far, the central banks uh, been downplaying weaker regional uh, results. But do you think that this latest data today that the economy is slowing uh, is enough to spur the ECB into some kind of action? You know, I think the, the slowdown is not going to move them into sort of delaying um, the removal of sort of extreme monetary policy. And what I'm speaking about is the asset purchase program. Uh, we do believe that they'll continue to unwind that, whether they tighten, you know, in early, mid-2019 is probably up for more debate and, and more sort of at risk 
with the European slowdown. But in terms of uh, freeing themselves from the sort of monthly asset purchase burden, I think uh, there's plenty of evidence that despite the, the slowdown uh, of the European economy from a very extended level, the, the, you know, the acceleration in, in Europe has been quite strong, um, will not sort of stop the ECB's um, efforts to, to remove sort of their, their or, or to refuel their toolbox, I should say, you know, uh, uh, more than anything else. And therefore, the impact here on the Swiss uh, SNB, the Swiss National Bank? Probably not much. Um, the SNB is very happy with their their uh, um, their policy. Most likely, they're going to sit back and, and wait for um, other players to move. Uh, inflation is ticking up slightly. We are seeing a slight weakness, you know, on the growth side. I think the SNB is very happy with their strategy. Mm. It's sort of you, you continue to watch the news flow and this idea that the, the Swiss franc is sort of removing itself as a safe haven trade is probably even more uh, good news to the SNB members because it means that when there is volatility, when there is risk in the marketplace, investors will not rush and start buying Swiss franc at the drop of a hat and cause sort of the, the Swiss uh, inflation story and growth story to derail because of a stronger Swiss franc. All right, Peter Rosenstrike from Swissquote, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for having me. And we've just got a bit of time for entertainment news. Goldie Hawn and Kurt Russell starred in the popular 1987 comedy Overboard. A new spin on the story finds the main character's gender roles reversed. CNN's Rick Damagella has the story. You're very attractive for a carpet cleaning lady, although you maybe could do something with your hair. Yeah. No, that's not it. It's your face. Yeah. Eugenio Derbez and Anna Ferris star in a remake of the rom-com Overboard. You're fired. I bet you haven't worked a single day in your entire self-absorbed life. Help! I'm quivering! He is the devil. The new version swaps the roles of the lead characters from the original. I play Kate Sullivan. Um, I am a, a hard-working single mom who's strapped for cash. I've got three daughters. I'm just trying to make ends meet when I meet Leo. Leonardo, Mon Leonardo Montenegro. I'm the rich, the rich uh, arrogant, jackass, cocky guy. You're so charming. I don't know what day it is. I don't even know my own name. Amnesia in our little town. That's him. I have an idea that is poetic in its justice. I play Kate's best friend, and, um, you know, really, I'm the one that pushes her to, to put this con on this guy, but for very good reason. It's poetic justice. And then I'm Bobby, her husband, who basically, you know, goes, you know, happy wife, happy life. I'm here to pick up my husband. You ruined my wife? For better or worse, baby. The family aspect of the movie extended behind the scenes. We became a family for those two months, and, and you can tell that on screen. We loved each other so much, and it, it was heartbreaking. I love that the movie honors the idea of family so much yeah. and and that your character gets so much reward out of you know it being part of of a family i like having your dad around we want to keep him in hollywood i'm rick damagella and that's it from us here on the newsmaker and also the swiss pulse you can watch us online cnn1a.ch we'll be back from six tomorrow good night CNN Money Switzerland weather. We start with the webcam of the day. Here is an overview of the values recorded in the last hours. And now the radar animation of the last 90 minutes. Let's have a look to the forecast for this afternoon. And for tomorrow. Here is an overview for the next days in German-speaking Switzerland. In Western Switzerland,
and south of the Alps. Thanks for following us.